continue to uh, work their way through the continuing resolution, temporary federal spending through fiscal year uh, 2013. The committee will come to order. Please close the doors. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. It's our job to work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is our mission. Today, we are dealing with exactly that kind of a situation. The IG's report issued yesterday began with watchdogs and whistleblowers making us aware of a fatally flawed operation known as Fast and Furious. Before I begin in, uh, with my opening statement in earnest, I want to first take time to thank Mr. Horowitz. On behalf of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, I want to congratulate him on, in fact, delivering an extremely comprehensive, strong, and independent report. Mr. Horowitz is not new to the department, but he's new to this job. And as Inspector General, a Senate-confirmed nomination of March 29th, <clears throat> and when you were sworn in on August 16th, we all asked the question, can you pick up and do this kind of a job on such a monumental task that had already languished for a period of time before your entrance? Yesterday, you proved to both sides of the aisle that you could, and I want to personally thank you. I note that, in fact, IGs serve a purpose that, in fact, we do not get and have not gotten from any administration, if not for the 74 IGs and the 12,000 men and women that work for them. The level of transparency, accountability over waste, fraud, abuse of power, abuse of discretion and the like would not be possible. This committee, more than any other in the con Congress, relies on their work. And yesterday, we were not disappointed. The 471-page report released yesterday is a huge step forward toward restoring the public faith in the Department of Justice. I was impressed with the professionalism and thoroughness and scope of the report. I know, having been only the day before with Brian Terry's family in Arizona, where we dedicated the Border Patrol station he worked out of before his untimely murder in 2010, that they too undoubtedly were impressed that a great deal of the closure they wanted by responsible parties at all levels was met yesterday. The conclusions after 19 months of hard work, of course, are greater than some would want and fall short of what others would want. They cannot, by definition, bring complete closure because even the IG in his report still has some questions. There were some individuals and some documents that are not yet available. But like any document, you have to at some point cut it off, come as you are, and bring what you have. I think this was the appropriate time. I'm particularly pleased that we waited an additional week to allow for materials that otherwise might not have been in the report. This committee has had a difficult relationship with justice, much of it because the Attorney General, no matter how many times we asked, no matter how many, how many times we subpoenaed, no, how many no matter how many meetings our staff had, were unable to get the level of cooperation necessary even to the information that the IG received. I hope in the next Congress, whoever sits in my chair will face an administration that understands 
that openness to Congress, openness to the Freedom of Information Act, and particularly openness to the Inspector General's offices is critical if the American people are to have confidence in their government. Much of what is in the report, but not the main subject of the report, has to do with the February 4, 2011 letter in which, admittedly now, the Justice Department falsely stated that in Operation Fast and Furious, guns did not walk. As I have often said since that time, the only way that statement could be true is if you believed for guns to walk, they had to have legs. Operation Fast and Furious is a poster child for what you don't do with deadly weapons. You don't lose track of them. You don't allow more and more and more of them to go. Well, in fact, you're already seeing the effects of those weapons killing people in Mexico. And let us make no mistake, weapons had already been found at deadly scenes of uh, crimes in Mexico before Fast and Furious shut down. Only the tragic loss of Brian A. Terry brought an end to Fast and Furious. Although this report will not bring a complete end to the need for us to work with justice to bring genuine reform to their process, it goes a long way toward that. I, was, I will particularly note that I'm pleased that in some cases the executive privilege invalidly claimed by the President of the United States was not asserted in this discovery. Some materials contained in this report do help us because they are, in fact, many of the items that we wish we had received. In some cases, we're told we, we received, but in fact, we later found were provided to the IG and not to us. The conclusions in any report by an IG are, in fact, respectful and less than conclusions as to what management must do. But already since yesterday, two top individuals whose time to resign had come 14, 16, 18, 19 months ago resigned. We expect that all 14 would find a way to find appropriate new occupations, ones in which their poor judgment or lack of dedication or unwillingness to actually read documents they were required to read would, be held, would not be held accountable. There is no place in our government for people who under statute are required to do something and then say, I didn't do it, but I didn't need to do it because somebody else did it below me. That's exactly why, why Congress puts in, in place a number of safeguards at what level things such as wiretaps uh, can be authorized. For the American people who know that ultimately a wiretap application is trusted by a judge in most cases who grants it, the only protection for the American people is in fact knowing that there are safeguards in the application, that an agent or an individual simply can't tap your phone by running up an application. The very safeguards that failed in Fast and Furious to know what was already known and that wiretaps would tell you in no uncertain terms that guns were walking, that same lack of, of safeguards could also cause anyone to see their phone tapped when in fact it should not be under the law. So I look at the protections not granted to safeguard against a fatally flawed uh, tactic like Fast and Furious, but I look at it to know as the uh, uh, IG noted in his report, that there need to be material changes and controls in how wiretap applications go through a process for approval. Now, over the next several hours, we will hear an awful lot from our witness, and I rely on our questions to be germane to our witness's 471-page report. I believe that, in fact, given an opportunity to have fair question and answer, we will understand, first of all, why Jason Weinstein resigned yesterday, why Kenneth Melson retired yesterday, and why there is much work to be done to reform the Department of Justice and the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agency in order for the American people and, I might note, the people of Mexico to have confidence in this government.
Lastly, nothing in this report vindicates anyone. If you touched, looked, could have touched, could have looked, could have asked for information that could have caused you to intervene, to complain, to worry, to talk to people, and you didn't, and you are in our government, or even if you aren't in our government but were aware of it, you fell short of your responsibility. We all have a responsibility to protect against firearms ending up in the hands of dangerous criminals. With that, I want to thank again our IG for being here today, and I yield to Mr. Cummings for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for calling this hearing. And let me welcome our witness, Mr. Horowitz, um, and to thank you and your staff, everybody from the uh, clerk to you. Uh, I want to make it very, very clear I join the chairman in expressing our appreciation. It is a thorough report. Your staff has done an outstanding job. I know that they've missed a lot of vacation days and missed time with their families. But I want them to understand that we truly, truly appreciate not only their work, but the excellent way in which they did it. And I hope they're listening. And uh, thank you again. Um, your office has worked for more than a year and a half on this investigation. They reviewed more than 100,000 pages of documents and interviewed 130 witnesses in compiling this very comprehensive report. They did it under the microscope of a highly politicized environment in which public accusations were sometimes made before the search for evidence even began. It was a difficult task. But he and you and your office did an admirable job, and, and again, we thank you. In my opinion, one of the most important things we can do here today is recognize the service of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry, who gave his life for his country. Although it cannot be truly, truly not, not, although it cannot truly offer any solace to his family, I hope this report provides at least some of the answers they have been searching for since Agent Terry's murder. Let me next commend Chairman Issa. We've had many disagreements about how this investigation should proceed, but the fact is, is that the committee uncovered a severe problem that was festering since 2006 in the Phoenix office of ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona that allowed criminals in Mexico and the United States to obtain hundreds of guns. This committee played an important role in exposing and halting these flawed operations. I also want to commend the Attorney General. I have lost count of how many times he has testified on this issue, but he has remained even-handed, respectful, and always true to the daunting and critical mission of the department he leads. He requested this IG investigation, and he has already put numerous reforms in place. To that end, I note that the administration did not assert executive privilege over any part of the Inspector General's report, over any of the documents relied on by the Inspector General. In fact, the Department went a step further. Yesterday, it sent to this committee more than 300 pages of additional documents that were withheld previously. I think this is a positive development. I've always believed, and I continue to believe, that the committee and the Department can resolve any lingering issues without further conflict. With this action by the Department, I urge the committee to reconsider its position and settle the remnants of this dispute without resorting to unnecessary and costly litigation that nobody in this country wants. With that, let me turn to the report in order to highlight several key points and raise some very specific questions. There can no longer be any doubt that gun walking began under the Bush administration. The IG report goes into great detail about Operation Wide Receiver, and it finds that ATF agents simply let guns walk. It also finds that wiretap affidavits in Operation Wide Receiver contain just as much detail as those in Fast and Furious. The IG report concludes, and I quote, these tactics were used by ATF 
more than three years before Operation Fast and Furious was initiated, end of quote. There can also no longer be any doubt that gun walking was never authorized or approved by the Attorney General or senior department officials, especially as some sort of top-down scheme or conspiracy against the Second Amendment. The IG report found that gun walking, and I quote, was primarily the result of tactical and strategic decisions by agents and prosecutors, end of quote. As the IG says in his written testimony for today's hearing, ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona, quote, share equal responsibility for the strategic and operational failures in operations wide receiver and fast and furious, end of quote. With these points in mind, I have two broad questions, Mr. Horowitz, which I hope you will address. First, how could this tactic have been used for so long, over the course of five years and two administrations? without the FTA ATF field office in Phoenix or the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona stepping in to halt it. What allowed it to go on for so long unchecked? Second, what should we do now to ensure that this never ever happens again? I know that the IG has made his recommendations and I have also made my own. Which of these recommendations have ATF and the Department already implemented, which should be prioritized, and which may require legislation. Again, Mr. Harvest, I thank you again and your staff for an excellent job. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I now ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Barber, be allowed to participate in today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I also would reserve the right to waive additional members in uh, as they arrive. Pursuant to our rules, members sitting on the dais will uh, be recognized only after all other uh, individuals on their side of the aisle have previously been recognized on a back and forth basis. But with that, I also would like to thank Mr. Barber for making the effort to uh, be there for the Brian Terry naming and for uh, representing that area. Of, of Arizona that I think uh, is so affected by Fast and Furious. Pursuant to the rules, all witnesses before this committee will be sworn, so I'd ask that our witness please rise to take the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? With that, uh, the record will recognize that Mr. Horowitz uh, answered in the affirmative. General, we normally talk a lot about the five minutes. Take the time you need to give us your opening, recognizing that it will be a long day of additional opportunities for you to answer questions not in your opening. And with that, the gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I ask that my full statement be made a part of the record. Without objections or order. And I, I have uh, pared that down somewhat so that I don't go on for 20 or 30 minutes, and I will try to stick to the five minutes, certainly. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you to the members of the committee uh, for inviting me to testify today about our report, a report that we released yesterday which details a pattern of serious failures in both ATF's and the U.S. Attorney's Office's handling of the investigations in Fast and Furious and Wide Receiver and the Justice Department's response two congressional inquiries about those flawed operations. This is my first opportunity to testify before the Congress since I was sworn in five months ago, and it's an honor to be here today. Um, during the confirmation process, I made a commitment to the Congress and to the American people that I would continue the strong tradition of my office for independence, nonpartisanship, impartiality, and fairness. Those are the standards that I and my office applied in conducting this review and in preparing this report. As in all of our work, we abided by one bedrock principle, to follow the facts and the evidence wherever they led. And as indicated previously, this report could not have been done without the extraordinary dedication of the staff and the employees in my office. They worked long nights, weekends, through vacations, 
and I couldn't thank them enough, and I appreciate the committees thanking them for their hard work. As indicated, we reviewed over 100,000 pages of documents here. We interviewed over 130 witnesses, many on multiple occasions. The witnesses we interviewed served at all levels of the department, from the current and the former attorneys general to the line agents in Arizona who handled the investigations. Very few witnesses refused our request to be interviewed, and where they ha did refuse, we noted those in the report. The Justice Department provided us with access to the documents we requested, including documents concern from post-February 4th concerning the Department's response to the congressional inquiries. We operated with complete and total independence in our search for the truth, and the decision about what to cover in this report and the conclusions that we reached were made by us and our office and by no one else. I'm pleased that we've been able to put forward to the Congress and to the American people a full and complete recitation of the facts that we found and the conclusions that we reached with minimal redactions by the department to our report. The administration made no redactions for executive privilege, even though our report evaluates in detail and reaches conclusions about the department's post-February 4th actions in responding to Congress. Additionally, at our request, the department has agreed to seek court authorization to unredact as much of the wiretap information that we included in this report as possible. If the court agrees to the department's request, we will shortly issue a revised version of the report with that material unredacted. The investigation that became known as Operation Fast and Furious began on October 31, 2009. By the time the indictment was announced on January 25, 2011, over a year later, ATF agents had identified more than 40 people connected to a trafficking conspiracy that was responsible for purchasing over 2,000 firearms for approximately $1.5 million in cash. Yet ATF agents seized only about 100 of those firearms that had been purchased. Numerous firearms that had been bought by straw purchasers were recovered by law enforcement officials at crime scenes in Mexico and in the United States. One such recovery occurred on December 14, 2010, in connection with the tragic shooting death of a federal law enforcement agent, U.S. Customs and Border Protection agent Brian Terry. Shortly thereafter, the flaws in Operation Fast and Furious became known, a result, as a result, of the willingness of a few ATF agents to come forward and tell what they knew about it, and as a result of the conduct of the investigation by the Congress. On February 28th, the Attorney General requested my office to conduct a review of Operation Fast and Furious, and we agreed to do so. During the course of our review, we received information about other ATF firearm trafficking investigations that raised serious questions about how they were conducted. Our report reviews one of them, Operation Wide Receiver. We concluded that both Operation Wide Receiver and Operation Fast and Furious were seriously flawed and supervised irresponsibly by ATF's Phoenix Field Division, by the U.S. Attorney's Office, and by ATF Headquarters, most significantly in their failure to adequately consider the risk to the public safety in the United States and Mexico. Both investigations sought to identify the higher reaches of firearms trafficking networks by deferring any overt law enforcement action against the individual straw purchasers, such as making arrests or seizing firearms, even when there was sufficient evidence to do so. The risk to the public's safety was immediately evident in both investigations. Almost from the outset of each case, ATF agents learned that the purchases were being financed by violent Mexican drug trafficking organizations and that firearms were destined for Mexico. Yet, in Operation Fast and Furious, we found that no one responsible for the case, either at the Phoenix Field Division or at ATF's headquarters or in the U.S. Attorney's Office, raised a serious question or concern 
about the government not taking earlier measures to disrupt a firearm trafficking operation that continued to purchase firearms with impunity for many months. We also did not find any persuasive evidence that supervisors in Phoenix, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, or at ATF headquarters raise serious questions or concerns about the risks to the public safety posed by the continuing firearm purchases or by the delay in arresting individuals who are engaged in the trafficking activity. This failure, we found, reflected a significant lack of oversight and urgency by both ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and a disregard by both for the safety of individuals in the United States and in Mexico. Our review revealed a series of misguided strategies, tactics, errors in judgments, and management failures that permeated ATF headquarters and the Phoenix Field Division, as well as the U.S. Attorney's Office and the headquarters of the Department of Justice. In the course of our review, we identified individuals ranging from line agents and prosecutors in Arizona to senior ATF officials in Washington, D.C., who bore a share of responsibility for ATF's knowing failures in both of these operations to interdict firearms illegally destined for Mexico and for pursuing this risky strategy without adequately taking into account the significant danger to public safety that it created. We also found failures by department officials related to these matters, including failing to respond accurately to a congressional inquiry about them. Based on our findings, we made six recommendations designed to increase the department's involvement in and oversight of ATF's operations, to improve coordination among the department's law enforcement components, and to enhance the department's wiretap application review and authorization process. The Inspector General's Office intends to closely monitor the department's progress in implementing these recommendations. Finally, we recommended that, that the department review the conduct and performance of the department personnel that are referenced in the report and determine whether discipline or other administrative action with regard to each of them is appropriate. Thank you again for the oppor opportunity to be here, and I look forward to answering any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Horowitz. Uh, I'll now recognize myself for first few questions. Uh, you were given a great deal of access uh, in order to do this, over 100,000 pages. Uh, would you characterize, I realize you didn't look at every page every day, but uh, would you characterize, were all 100,000 pages ones that you would have made available to this committee? Were you deciding to have us see those documents? As you know, we received less than 8,000 pages. Well, as we went through, I have to, personally, I didn't obviously go through myself the 100,000 plus pages, but we I'll, I'll ask it. I'll ask it in reverse. Maybe is is probably better. Do you know of pages that you saw that Congress should, for good cause, be denied? Um, every document we asked for and reviewed and cited in this report, we found to be relevant and important. And in fact, we don't cite in this report every single relevant document. We obviously had to pick and choose. So, certainly, what we've seen and we asked for and saw we determined was relevant. So it would be fair to say the documents from post-February post 4th, which you evaluated, saw, and helped you prepare this report in which executive privilege was not claimed, were relevant, you used them, and they should have been provided to Congress in the ordinary course. They are being provided indirectly at this time. We certainly found they were re relevant, which is why we insisted on reporting on them, Mr. Chairman. Now, uh, there are a number of people that are number of uh, people you didn't get to speak to. Uh, I'll note, I guess, Mr. Cunningham spoke to you and then later would not speak to you. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, can you tell us a little bit about your efforts to try to interview uh, Kevin O'Reilly, a uh, member of the National Security Team? Um, we reached out to his lawyer, uh, requested an interview. We have no basis to compel interviews from individuals who are outside the Department of Justice. He does not work in the Department of Justice, so we had to ask for a voluntary interview, and he denied our, his lawyer told us he would not appear voluntarily. Would it surprise you that he's been in Afghanistan and we've been denied even the ability to serve a subpoena well, on him? I was not aware of where he was, but I was told by his lawyer. I'm sorry, Iraq. Uh, sorry. 
um, as I said, we weren't, uh, I don't recall knowing myself where he was, but we were told by his counsel he would not appear voluntarily. Okay. Uh, also, there was a, a full-time uh, employee of the Department of Homeland Security. Would you explain to us your efforts to interview that individual? Yes. Um, this was, there was an agent from Department of Homeland Security that was assigned to the operation. Um, as part of our effort to be thorough and interview all people who might have relevant information, we reached out. Um, he, again, is outside the Department of Justice, so he declined our voluntary request to be interviewed by us. We um, sought through the Department of Homeland Security to speak to him, um, and we understood that absent being compelled and given immunity, that he would not speak voluntarily, and that, was, that request was declined, is my understanding. Now, pursuant, and this is outside of, I, I admonished everyone to stay on to this, but I think for this particular case, I want to go outside the scope of this somewhat. We are the committee that will oversee a change in the IG Act, if there is one. Uh, in your opinion, if the IG Act had created a mechanism for you to fully vet these requests, even if these were individuals outside of your particular narrow agency, uh, is that something you believe would be helpful, speaking as an IG, for future investigations? Yeah, certainly, we would have used whatever authorities we had to seek testimony from individuals, as we were able to do internally within the Justice Department. So having expanded authority would have certainly allowed us to take additional actions here. Were you ever made aware of why Secretary Napolitano, Department of Homeland Security, was unwilling to have an individual who worked in an OSADEF of such a fatally flawed uh, event, one that killed one of her charges, one of the Border Patrol that falls under her uh, uh, cabinet position, why, why she wouldn't insist that that individual speak to you in this investigation? I don't know personally that information, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, now, uh, one of the uh, two last areas, uh, it has been said by many, mostly on the other side of the aisle, that there's nothing in these wiretap applications that would have caused senior uh, officials to uh, see any red flags as to the reckless uh, tactics. Now, realizing these documents are not unsealed, would you characterize for us whether you would say, as your report does, uh, and I'll quote, I'll read this, but I'd like you to elaborate. Among the report's other conclusions, your findings that wiretap applications approved by senior officials did contain red flags about reckless tactics who should have acted on this information, uh, and it goes on. That, that line, is that, is that, were we to conclude that, in fact, if you read one or more of these 14 uh, wiretap applications, you should have known that guns were walking? Yes, as we said in the report, and I also myself reviewed the 14 applications, believe that if you were focused and looking at the question of gun walking, you would read these reports and see many red flags, you know, these affidavits and see many red flags in our view. Okay, and I ask unanimous consent for just one more question without objection. Uh, in your report, uh, there was an area that I focused on a little bit where it implied that uh, Lanny Brewer uh, did not respond uh, or, you know, did, did not acknowledge the February 4th uh, letter. Isn't it true that Lanny Brewer, in fact, answered good job uh, as a, at least an answer to uh, the February 4th letter acknowledging that he had received it and obviously made that comment? That's correct. And on that day, on February 4th, wasn't he, in fact, on his way to Mexico City to sell the Mexican government on what was effectively a gun walking program coordinated with them? Well, my understanding is actually was in Mexico, and my understanding was that he had raised the possibility of some program involving cross-border cooperation about gun trafficking activity, but frankly, I don't have more knowledge than that at this point. Thank you. I recognize the ranking member for his questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Horowitz, I want to walk through some quick points with you and then ask you to respond in more detail to some broader questions. You examine Operation Wide Receiver, which was during the Bush administration, and Operation Fast and Furious, which was during this administration. Is that right? Uh, correct. We looked at both of those matters. In your report, you found that gun walking occurred in both operations. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, we are not talking 
only about botched coordination efforts with Mexico. We're talking about ATF agents stopping surveillance in the United States and letting guns walk in both operations. Is that correct? Correct. In fact, your report said this, and I quote, Operation Wide Receiver was noteworthy because it informed our understanding of how these tactics were used by ATF more than three years before Operation Fast and Furious was initiated. Uh, end of quote. Is, is that what your report said? That is. Now, you also found that neither Attorney General McCasey nor Attorney General Holder authorized or approved gun walking. Is that right? That's correct, although I would note Attorney General McCasey was sworn in after the completion of Operation Wide Receiver's investigative portion of the activity. So you also found that there were wiretap applications in both operations and that the wiretap applications in Wide Receiver included the same kinds of potential red flags you found in Fast and Furious affidavits. Is that correct? We found red flags existing in Wide Receiver as well. But Deputy Assistant Attorney Generals uh, from both administrations did not routinely read these affidavits, according to your report. Uh, you interviewed officials from both administrations, and they told you their normal practice was to read only summary memos. Is that correct? We interviewed three of the five deputy AAGs who reviewed the 14 wiretaps, and all of the three that we interviewed, I don't want to I understand. I, don't, I, don't, I want you to just tell uh, us what happened. That all three indicated that uh, uh, they could not, uh, they, they did not routinely read the affidavits when they came to them. And clearly, I want to make it clear that I, I, I believe that we need to, when it, there is reform, and I think your assistants mentioned this yesterday, and I'm sure the uh, chairman would agree with me, we need, we need to make sure folks read the affidavits. But then, would you agree? Uh, I agree, and I actually formerly was a deputy AAG in the criminal division, so uh -huh. uh, I'm 12 years out of date, but uh, I, I remember reviewing them. Now, for both operations, you also found that gun walking was not ordered from the top, but instead was, and I quote, primarily the result of tactical and strategic decisions by the agents and prosecutors, end of quote. Is that right? That's right. Uh, you said in your testimony that ATF and U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona, and I quote, share equal responsibility for strategic and operational failures in operations wide receiver and fast and furious. So here are my questions, and I think these questions will go to the heart of the reform that I hope that we will be able to, to get underway. How could these tactics have continued in Phoenix over a span of five years and two administrations without being stopped either by ATF or the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona. My second question is how should uh, this, how should it have worked? And if an ATF agent came to his superiors in Phoenix with this kind of plan today, how should it be examined and vetted now? Well, as to the first question, uh, I think there were a serious lack of controls in place in both the U.S. Attorney's Office and ATF operation, primarily ATF, because they are the law enforcement agency that needs approval. We highlighted one of them as an example, even though ATF for eight years has been in the Department of Justice, the Attorney General guidelines for use of undercover operations were never amended to cover ATF. Um, so there were a series of failures in the controls. We've made significant recommendations in that area. The Department and ATF have put in place additional tools and controls already, but there has to be a serious review and vetting of operations like this that impact not only the number of guns and the communities that are impacted by these, but that involve a foreign operation involving guns going to a foreign country. That wasn't there at the time. So there needs to be a serious look at that. And how to prevent that is, uh, going forward, is uh, watching carefully to make sure, in fact, the reforms we're all talking about aren't lost once the headlines of the reform, once the headlines of the report go away, that there is oversight follow-up by the Inspector General's office and I'm sure by the Congress in this regard. Just one last question. Um, it seems as if uh, Mr. Melson, who was heading ATF, seems like, uh, from reading the report, seems like he may have fallen asleep at the switch. I mean, would you, I mean, what, what, I mean, from what you saw, again, this is ahead of ATF. Right. Um, tell us, can you tell us about what your report uh, says about that? 
Yes. Um, we found in Operation Fast and Furious uh, that there was significant information coming to ATF headquarters. In fact, by March of 2010, the deputy director of ATF, who was an experienced agent and had served in the ATF for a considerable period of time, for the first time in his career asked for an exit strategy because of his concern about what he had seen. He asked for it. It didn't come to headquarters for six weeks. And it wasn't reviewed by the deputy director until a, almost a year later after the shooting of Agent Terry and after the indictment occurred. The fact that the deputy director could see the need for an exit strategy in March of 2010 and not receive it and review it until 2011 I think speaks volumes about what happened here in terms of failures of oversight. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, with that, we recognize the distinguished gen Oh, with that, I ask unanimous consent that General Lady from Florida, Ms. Adams, be allowed to participate in today's hearing without objection so ordered. With that, we now go to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I appreciate your tenacity in continuing to go after this. We have a dead Border Patrol agent, nearly 2,000 AK-47s released, hundreds of dead Mexicans, a Me Mexican helicopter shot down at one point, a dead Border Patrol agent, hundreds of guns that are still unaccounted for, untold number of crimes that have been committed with these guns, and an attorney general whose best guess and best argument is that is a plea of ignorance. And so it, I think Mr. Cummings... Uh, the ranking member asked the most salient question. How does this go on for so long without somebody saying something's wrong here? I have a fundamental problem and challenge with the fact that the acting uh, ATF director, Mr. Melson, is in that position for two years and met with the attorney general one time. One time. That's inexcusable in my book. I also think what happened, part of the, the conclusion I think validates what we've been concerned about for so long, is that the adult in the room, the head of the criminal division, is supposed to be Lanny Brewer. But Lanny Brewer, having been briefed on what happened previously, knew about gun walking, knew about these straw purchases, and said nothing about it. He didn't issue a new edict that says we're not going to do this be anymore. In fact, you would be led to believe that by just allowing it to continue on, no new directive that he was actually endorsing this. That's what I take around for it. I think this is a wonderful report. I appreciate the thoroughness. I think you're a professional and did a great job. I think you're a little so soft on Lanny Brewer. To suggest, as you did on page 314, moreover, Brewer did not supervise Operation Fast and Furious and did not authorize any activities in the investigation, I think is, um, I would disagree with that statement. Jason Weinstein reported to Lanny Brewer. And as you, this report clearly highlights, Jason Weinstein is being made as the key person that, that was probably most uh, responsible here. I would also point out to my colleagues that on February 4th, 2011, of all the days, the day that we are issued, uh, specific to Senator Grassley, a letter that was totally false about ATF's activities. By the way, this letter doesn't even mention Fast and Furious. It says that these guns were allowed to walk, or that, that ATF does not allow guns to walk in any way, shape, or form. I would point to the February 4th uh, memorandum about uh, a, uh, the Assistant Attorney General Brewer going to Mexico. As a synopsis to that, in Mexico, he proposed to the Mexican uh, government, uh, Assistant Attorney General Brewer suggested allowing straw purchases cross into Mexico. I, I, I mean, we have in black and white a document suggesting that he's not only uh, approving of, of these types of activities, he's advocating for these types of activities. So to answer Mr. Cummings' question, it's crystal clear. The head of the criminal division was down there pitching the Mexican government that we ought to be doing more of this. That's why it continued, because the, the, the person in charge was advocating for it. He knew about it previously, and when he did hear about it, he did nothing about it. In fact, when that letter on February 4th goes out the door, he had seen it, and he said nothing about it. And then what's worse is, after the letter goes out, everybody at the Department of Justice knows that it's wrong. It takes 10 months for them to fess up on it. In fact, they issue another letter in May, again, compounding the problem, hiding the, from the American people in this Congress the truth. Mr. Chairman, I'd also highlight uh, what is said on page 277 by the uh, Inspector General. We found that the affidavits described, we're talking about the wiretap applications. 
we found that the affidavits described specific incidents that would suggest to a prosecutor who was focused on the question of investigative tactics that the ATF was employing a strategy of not interdicting weapons or arresting known straw purchasers. Nevertheless, June 7, 2012, the Attorney General testifying in the, in the Judiciary Committee uh, in response to uh, uh, Congressman Quayle, I have looked at these affidavits, I have looked at the summaries, there is nothing in those affidavits as I reviewed them that indicates that gun walking was allowed. A direct contradiction and very different from what the uh, Inspector General has looked at and I appreciate you seeking uh, the unsealing of these documents so that we can all seal them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm also concerned that there was a culture an environment where people were either afraid or not willing or didn't want to share with the Attorney General key information specific to what we were doing with Mexico. And what I would highlight, and I'm running out of time here, the culture and the environment was not conducive to have the truth surface. It is shocking and troubling to me that we did not, that the Department of Justice never communicated to the senior people at the Homeland Security where one of their agents was dead and still hasn't to this day, I've questioned them. The, the Secretary of Homeland Security didn't ask the Attorney General what was going on, nor did we ever communicate with Secretary Hilton, uh, uh, Secretary um, of, of the State Department so that she could deal with this situation. We, we pour thousands of weapons into Mexico and we never bothered to tell the Secretary of State, isn't that her job, role, and responsibility? That's one of the things I think we also have to look at because that is one of the compounding problems that happened along this way, even after we knew all these facts. And still to this day, I don't think the Department of Justice ever solved. Would the uh, Inspector General want to answer any implied question there? Uh, no. Okay. With that, we recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Loney, for uh, five minutes. First of all, I'd like to uh, welcome the IG and, and note that he is from the great state of New York. We're very proud of you, even though you're now a Washingtonian, and uh, congratulations on your public service. We appreciate very much your, uh, your report. Uh, first of all, on guns, if you were so concerned about guns on the border, uh, then uh, my colleagues could have supported the bills that we put forward, the Democrats, uh, to really for gun safety. So, in my opinion, you're not serious. Let's, if you're worried about guns at the border, then let's have, let's make it a, a federal crime to traffic guns. Let's uh, make it a crime for, for straw, vast sales of these guns. Let's ban assault weapons that aren't used to do anything but kill people. They don't kill animals, they just kill people. There are a number of things that we could do right now that would get the guns off of the border. And the Mexican government supports it. They've asked us to do so. When we came forward with our bills, we got a, a letter from the President of Mexico saying this is wonderful. That'll help guns on the border. But I'd like to do what the Chairman wanted, which is to focus on this excellent report that Mr. Horowitz came out with. And uh, I'd, I'd like to refer that in December of 211, uh, our Attorney General uh, explained to the House Judiciary Com Committee that gun walk walking in Operation Fast and Furious I like to call it vast and curious, originated with the local Phoenix office of the ATF and the U.S. Attorney, and that it was not the result of any strategy or directive from uh, Maine Justice. And he said, and may I quote, I mean the notion that people in Washington, the leadership of the department, approve the use of those tactics in Fast and Furious is simply incorrect. This was not a top to bottom operation. This was a regional operation that was controlled by ATF and by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Phoenix. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, uh, your, your report reaches a similar conclusion, pointing back to the genesis of these tactics, tactics by the field agents and prosecutors in Phoenix. And this is what your report says about Operation Wide Receiver, and I quote, in sum, the evidence demonstrated that the decision to not interdict the firearms despite having probable cause to do so was a decision made by the ATF Phoenix Field Division and was intended to advance ATF's broader goal of identifying additional participants in the conspiracy." End quote. So, so my question to you, Mr. Horowitz, is and I believe it's the main question that we have, 
had as a committee is how it, is it that these tactics started? What went wrong? Can you explain what you found in your investigation that would explain how these tactics first started being used in Operation Wide Receiver? Uh, in Operation Wide Receiver, uh, what appears to have occurred is that information came to the agents uh, in the Tucson office of the Phoenix Field Division, uh, and they made a conscious decision to not take any action to stop the trafficking with the straw purchasers because they wanted to follow the guns and figure out to whom they were ultimately going. And that was a decision made early on in the investigation, almost at the outset. And it was done with the acquiescence and approval of the U.S. Attorney's Office. So that is why we found that there was a failure by both offices. And, and, and that was the office in Phoenix, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. U.S. Attorney's Office for Arizona, for the District of Arizona. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what about the operation uh, Fast and Furious? Did the agents have bad motives? Or did they just fail to consider the public risk involved? What were they thinking? Uh, they did not have bad motives, as far as we found. What we heard from the agents was they had made a conscious decision that the long-term uh, effort, that, that having a long-term investigative strategy that dismantled a large organization was the greater good that they were undertaking, to dismantle the organization, stop the trafficking, and that that was what they believed was in the best interest of the public safety. As we found, that was an incorrect calculation. Law enforcement's primary objective is to protect the public. You can't take action to let guns walk that will harm people for the greater good. What can we do to make sure that this does not happen again? Well, I think first and foremost, there needs to be the serious reform and controls we've outlined at ATF. There has to be an internal change in how cases are managed there. There needs to be supervision, there needs to be oversight, and, and, and thoughts about investigations like this need to be carefully reviewed at the highest levels of the organization at the outset, not deferred to, uh, to the line agent or to their super line supervisors. That to me is the first and most important effort at reform. So you would say that that is the most important reform that you think the department could take? Initially, I think mm -hmm. that's a step that's apparent that has to happen. Mm -hmm. I think there are many other reforms that we've outlined, including, for example, making sure that at the Department of Justice in the Criminal Division, deputy AAGs are reviewing the wiretap applications when they get them. That's another reform we've put forward. Mm -hmm. There needs to be clear policies in place within ATF as to what is allowed and what isn't allowed. So that it's not just reviewing and vetting, it's a clear line as to what is and is not permitted. Thank the gentlelady. We now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Inspector General, when I met with you several weeks ago, I left that meeting cautiously optimistic that we would receive a thorough, balanced, uh, report and and my uh, optimism was rewarded uh, uh, because of you and your staff. I also shared uh, in no small part, I'm sure, because of your exemplary service in the Southern District of New York and with the Department of Justice. Your your career as a prosecutor gave me that cautious optimism, and I shared with you that this was never about politics to me. I don't care which party is in power. It was about a dead border patrol agent and holding the institutions of government responsible for what they've done. And I think it's wonderful at one level that we have an independent entity like you to investigate. I just naively thought that's what the Department of Justice was. I, na I naively thought the Attorney General as the top law enforcement official in the Department of Justice was that independent entity that we could trust. And whether it's the letters uh, in March uh, and February of 2011, whether it's testimony that's been delivered to committees of Congress, uh, sadly, uh, the Department of Justice uh, was not vindicated despite some of the headlines this morning. The wiretap applications. I've specifically asked the Attorney General, are you sure that someone reading these wiretap applications and the summaries would not be left with the conclusion that gun walking was the tactic that was used? And he said yes, he was sure. And your report debunks that. Uh, you used to read wiretap applications, correct? Correct. And, and your conclusion with that background is that a reasonably prudent person reading these applications and summaries would have been on notice way back when 
that the tactic of gun walking was being used. Is that correct? Yes, for someone who was look, watching it, looking for it in that context of gun walking, I agree that they would have seen those red flags. Uh, that was a startling conclusion that you reached. Another startling fact, I don't want to say it's a conclusion, but a fact that you uh, included in your report, and you correct me if I'm mischaracterizing what, what, what you wrote, but the Attorney General, even today, does not believe that a dead Border Patrol agent from an, from an agency that he doesn't supervise who is, who is killed by a weapon as part of an investigation of an agency he does supervise is something that should be brought to his attention. Does your report not include a paragraph that even today the Attorney General is not sure that this fact pattern should have been brought to his attention? As we included in the report, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, it, the Attorney General told us that it would not necessarily be something he would be expected to be notified of and we're talking about not the death, because he was notified about the death, but about the fact that two firearms were found at the scene that were connected to Operation Fast and Furious. Right, but Inspector General, you were a prosecutor, I was a prosecutor, others up here have been prosecutors. When you have a dead law enforcement officer, the next words out of your mouth are, I want to know everything there possibly is to know about how this happened. I don't just want to know what the autopsy says, I want to know how we got to this point. And, and which does speak to management, and it does speak to a duty to supervise, not just a commonsensical duty. I want to ask you specifically about the Code of Professional Responsibility. Is there a duty to supervise for supervisory attorneys to supervise the work of those underneath them? Not a common law or a commonsensical obligation, but is there a Code of Professional Responsibility obligation to supervise? Um, I'm not sure I could speak directly to the uh, Code of Professional Responsibility in that regard because we were looking at obviously whether there were supervisory failures. We clearly found there was an obligation as part of the performance responsibilities of the agents and the prosecutors to supervise and the failure to do that was a serious management failure in our estimation in our view. All right, there are two letters, uh, one in February and one in, in May, uh, both of which were demonstrably false. Uh, you can uh, argue that they were calculated to mislead, but there can be no argument that they were false. Uh, they were signed by Ronald Weich, but uh, where uh, I guess the largest exception I take to your report is the same one that Mr. Chaffetz had. Uh, Lanny Brewer was the criminal chief. Lanny Brewer was responsible at some level for the approval of the wiretap applications. Lanny Brewer forwarded this February 4th letter, which was demonstrably false, to a home computer. And you don't have to be a real good prosecutor to uh, deduce that you forward something to a home computer because you're going to read it. I can't think of any other reason to forward a letter other than to read it, unless you're a historian or an archivist. And I don't think he's either one of those. And then he confirms our suspicions by writing, good job. So. Given the duty to supervise, given the false letters, given the failure to connect the dots, as he said and you concluded, I, I, I just find it, I, I can't imagine a headline that reads, passengers charged with driving, driver, uh, passengers charged with speeding, driver exonerated. I, I can't imagine that headline. But yet we have DOJ people that were under Lanny Brewer who are either resigning or being disciplined. How does he escape discipline? You know, as our report outlines, uh, we found that uh, Mr. Brewer, back in April 2010, knew about, learned about the gun walking tactics in wide receiver. And as we outlined in the report, it was a failure by him to alert the deputy or the attorney general to that because ATF reports to the deputy, not to him. So it was incumbent upon him, in our view, to report it to the deputy and the attorney general. And again, when the letter came in, from Senator Grassley nine months later or so, in January of 2011, we believed, as he ultimately testified, that he should have alerted the department to that. Those were two findings we made. As to what the discipline or decision is as to uh, discipline or administrative or other conduct or other related failures, that's really a decision ultimately under the system, under our uh, system to the Attorney General. I have authority to investigate, make the findings, which I did, 
and then it's up to the Attorney General uh, to decide what, if any, discipline to impose. I Thanks. thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and I especially thank you, Mr. Horowitz, for a very thorough job where you had to dig into a lot of weeds. And I do, ex I, I do appreciate the way, the way you connected the dots and drew the line so that we understood where the responsibility went. I, uh, my line of questions really goes to why uh, this investigation has gone on for so long and why the public was concerned about it. The, the face of this um, investigation, the poster boy, as it were, has been the Attorney General of the United States. Uh, and the, 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 the committee has, has had hearings where uh, over and over again, it was alleged that the gun walking was known at the highest levels, even by the Attorney General, and that this was an approved plan, approved by, uh, at, 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 to, 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 to quote uh, from <coughs> a recent record, <coughs> at the highest levels of the Obama appointees. Now, I think it's only fair when the Attorney General, over and over again, has been the face of this investigation, the one held responsible for the gun walking, to put on the record what you have found with respect to the Attorney General of the United States. Now, um, you have indicated that you received cooperation from, from the highest levels of the, of the Justice Department in doing your and uh, in, in, uh, doing your investigation? Yes, we received the documents that we asked for and um, as indicated, other than the handful of individuals who refused to speak with us, we generally were able to speak with everybody we wanted. Did you speak with the Attorney General of the United States? Uh, we did. You did not? We did. You did. Uh, may I ask you, did you find any evidence that Attorney General Holder approved of the gun walking uh, tactics that are under investigate that have been under investigation by this committee. Uh, as we outlined in the report, we found no evidence that uh, the attorney general was aware in 2010, before Senator Grassley's letter, of Operation Fast and Furious and the tactics that were associated with it. So the attorney general could not have approved because he did not even know about the gun walking tactics before. 2010. Yeah, we found no evidence that he had been told in 2010. Um, now let's go to other high levels of the Justice Department. Uh, did you find any evidence that the acting deputy, uh, Gary Grindler, knew uh, or authorized uh, gun walking? We found that acting deputy attorney general was briefed about operation fast and furious in march of 2010 but we concluded after looking at what that briefing involved which was item four of a seven item agenda in a 45 minute briefing that it wasn't a sufficient briefing to uh, uh, put him on notice directly and expressly that gun walking was occur that it had occurred it did we thought uh, it was sufficient to trigger questions, but not sufficient to put him on notice. And we were particularly troubled by the fact that he was never briefed again by ATF. When, within two weeks after that briefing, the deputy director had asked for the exit strategy that I referenced earlier, that no one, <clears throat> excuse me, that no one went back to him uh, to tell him that information. So th <clears throat> this controversy centered in the U.S. Attorney's Office and at the ATF. Um, your, 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 your last answer, does that mean that you think they um, deliberately try to, to keep the uh, deputy, uh, the acting deputy attorney general, uh, from knowing uh, about the, the parts of Fast and Furious that perhaps were most controversial? We, we didn't find any evidence of deliberateness. Again, this is a situation where uh, the deputy director of ATF had asked for an exit strategy. March and never looked at it until 2011. So uh, it would be uh, uh, 
hard to explain what was going on or what people were thinking given that level of failure of oversight. Mr. Horowitz, uh, to your knowledge, is anyone at the Justice Department uh, looking into um, perhaps the um, most important new tool the Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney could have, uh, a tool that uh, might have um, uh, been useful to the U.S. Attorney in dealing with the, this, the gun walking. Are we left at the end of this investigation with uh, gun walking and um, whatever else uh, anybody can think of to do something about it? Is, is there any work going on in the Justice Department as a result of your investigation uh, to give ATF or the U.S. Attorney, uh, Arizona here, the kinds of tools that would, in fact, mean that nobody would even think about a, a uh, surreptitious way to get at guns like, um, like gun walking and Fast and Furious? What I've been told about the Department's response to this is we've highlighted in the report are the reforms that are needed within ATF, within the Justice Department's review of wiretaps, within its law enforcement agencies, uh, uh, operations generally. Beyond that, I haven't been informed of any additional steps the Department's taken. Thank, Thank you, you. lady. We now go to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, and I would ask if you would yield for 15 seconds. I will. Following up on the previous two uh, Democratic questions, isn't it true that the then Chief of Staff, when asked if the DAG knew, the Deputy Attorney General knew, then the Attorney General should have been briefed related to what they knew about Fast and Furious and obviously the question of whether Fast and Furious weapons were found at the scene of uh, Brian Terry's murder? That's correct, and also that's what we found in our report. Thank you. Mr. Gosar. Thank you, Mr. Horowitz. Thank you. Uh, um, as, as my previous colleague had say, uh, said that uh, I uh, uh, grilled you when you came to talk to me, and, and thank you very, very much for instilling some trust. Um, in your discovery with witnesses' paperwork, um, did anyone within your uh, uh, findings within the DOJ system raise question about the truthfulness and possible misleading testimony that was being presented by the Attorney General in his testimony to Congress? Uh, no one uh, indicated that in their interviews with Did you directly ask the question? Um, I'd have to go back, frankly, and look at the transcript. We would like you to ask that question. Okay. Um, in, t in detailing up with uh, uh, Lanny Brewer, um, it is my understanding that Lanny or Mr. Brewer um, sent um, and, and wide receiver, I, you know, closed in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. The investigative activity right. ended in 2000. So we should know something about it. So Mr. Brewer sent members from the criminal division to review the auspices and, and directives of Operation Wide Receiver, true? Correct. Isn't this like having a prior? I, I'm a dentist, but this is like even worse than what Operation Wide Receiver would have been because you know the outcomes here and you're still permitting it to go. And if I'm not mistaken, that's in March of 2010, right? Uh, March uh, and April, I believe it's April of 2010 that the meeting occurs uh, where um, Mr. Brewer uh, is a form that there's going to be a meeting and his deputy goes to that meeting to discuss gun walking and wide receiver. And that's with Mr. Voth, right? Uh, that's with Mr. Hoover, the deputy director. Oh, and then it gets better. And the deputy assistant director, McMahon. So then it gets even better because, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Voth comes to Washington, D.C. and does a presentation on uh, March of, of uh, 2010, March 5th, I'm not, not mistaken. I think Joe Cooley was at that presentation, right, at the direction uh, right. of uh, on, Mr. Brewer? On the March 5th presentation, that's correct. So he... All these pieces are pointing to Mr. to Brewer that he knows about this early on, and and yet we 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 have a pro I, I I have a problem with this with Mr. Brewer because he's he's directly in the line of fire from what I'm seeing here, and and we've got problems because not only does he go to send somebody back to Arizona, um, but he also has and listens to Mr. Voss presentation and almost gets the thumbs up no caution flags at all. And just like the wiretaps, these are alarming discoveries. Yeah, it, it is clear that Mr. Brewer was aware in April 2010 about the gun walking and wide receiver, which is why we were troubled by his decision to not tell the Deputy Attorney General or the Attorney General about it, because they have authority over ATF. He does not. Okay. And so that's why we found he should have done that. 
it seems to me, but it's very alarming because I think the scrutiny on Fast and Furious is much higher than what wide receiver is. Uh, they're both egregious, don't get me wrong. But this is, to me, you already know the results, and then you're making the results even worse. Well, and that's why we were troubled when the information came to the department from Senator Grassley in January of 2011 that those dots weren't connected by Mr. Brewer uh, and by his deputy, Mr. Weinstein. Okay. You know, um, the day after Brian Terry was killed, the Attorney General actually emailed three people asking for details, did he not? That's correct. I believe it was the day after, I, but I remember, yeah. the, recall the details. Um, this includes uh, Gary Grindler, uh, Monty Wilkinson, um, who failed to, to inform the Attorney General in connection of the, Terry, uh, the Brian Terry murder with weapons from Fast and Furious, true? Uh, that's correct. The failure to notify him about the connection between the two guns found at the scene, that they had been bought 11 months earlier, by a subject that had been identified in Fast and Furious. Now, going back to my colleague from South Carolina, you know, when a, a law officer is, is, is murdered, there's a lot of uh, raised tensions and a lot of questions being asked. We have a whole scenario of things that, that occur here. I mean, the, the questions should have been asked and we should have had a better outcome. Um, but, you know, there was another incident in Arizona uh, late January. Um, that should have had, I mean, my understanding with even Congressman Giffords is questions were abounding. Um, was one of these guns being used? Was that not? Uh, I, I believe so. So we should have known, I mean, you know, the Attorney General's testimony to me seems flawed, is that we would have been asking and should have known much earlier about these questions about Fast and Furious based upon the inquisition of the witnesses or, or witnesses to these crimes. And, and the nature of these crimes and the audacity of these crimes, particularly to higher um, uh, members like Congress, right? Well, as I indicated in the report, uh, we certainly believed that when that information about the guns connected to the death, uh, to the shooting scene of a law enforcement agent, that that kind of information needs to go to the Attorney General of the United States. And so it was, just, it, it was covered up? Well, I don't know whether it was covered up or not, but it was not told to him. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witness uh, for a very, very thorough report, uh, extremely thorough. Uh, Churchill might say that this report defends itself against the risk of being read uh, by, <laughs> by, by its very length. Uh, However, I'm working my way through it, started with the conclusions and, and going through it in great, great detail. But you do address a lot of the questions that we've raised here in uh, five or more hearings. Um, I do want to ask you one point, though, uh, about vindication. Some are saying people are vindicated, some people are, are not. But in, in prior hearings, uh, the accusations uh, were against the Attorney General. And uh, Attorney General Holder had come before the committee uh, several times, also over in the Senate. And the allegation was that the accusation was that he knew. He knew about this operation. He ran it. And, uh, and the blame lied with him. Now, I read your report, and it says that there was no evidence, no evidence that, that he knew. Uh, you do, I think, accurately pinpoint some people who are ultimately responsible. You name them. You, you, you identify the flaws in their thinking, their misguided strategies, uh, their, their uh, misguided tactics, and how they made mistakes during this whole process. And it was a, a terrible and tragic mistake. Uh, you were also highly critical of some others. So with the... And, and in fairness, there were, there were cross allegations against Attorney General Mukasey as well, uh, that, that he knew more about wide receiver when, when he was in, in office as Attorney General. Yet, after this very thorough analysis, you say there, were no, there was no evidence that either Attorney General Holder or Attorney General Mukasey knew of those operations. And, and so, uh, I'm asking you, do you believe that this report vindicates uh, Attorney General Holder and, and, and fair, fair enough, uh, Attorney General Mukasey? 
given the their their lack of uh, lack of information about what was going on. Um, I think the report speaks to what we found and didn't found in our conclusions, and I'll I'll stand by the very lengthy uh, I agree with you report, um, but and not try and recharacterize or characterize it today myself. Okay. Uh, would fair, the gentleman, fair, fair would gentleman yield uh, perhaps sure, I could sure assist? I, yeah. I think from the chair's standpoint, I think your point is extremely good, that nowhere in this report did we find specific incrimination of they knew either one of these attorneys general. And I think that's, that's an important point, and it's one that I think, for the record, the committee should be aware of, is that uh, I don't think anyone should have assumed that they knew we certainly would all wish that any attorney general would ask to know more and would have known more. And I think the uh, inspector general's report does cast blame for high-ranking people not asking more questions. But I agree with the gentleman that neither attorney general was found to know it. Right. And, and, and rec reclaiming my time. Uh, we stopped the clock for that question, well, by the way. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for that courtesy. Uh, but look, this is a big agency. We got thousands of employees. This is a we we have, at least the report indicates and identifies an assistant deputy attorney general in one one division, who failed to report, failed to inform his superior, and and so we say, so the implication is that the 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 U.S. attorney general should know what every single assistant deputy uh, attorney general knows and fails to report, and I. I we, we have just, uh, I didn't vote for it, but this Congress has just held the Attorney General in contempt, the House did. And, and, and I just, uh, I think, you know, based on this report, uh, the, the suggestion by many and some in this committee was that the Attorney General was withholding information to protect himself because he was involved. And I just, and this report, this very thorough, very professional, very well done report, impartial, very objective, based on the facts, based on documents not available to this committee, based on interview of 130 witnesses, many not available to this committee, interviewed multiple times, have concluded that that, that was wrong. That was wrong. This attorney general, uh, while not perfect, was not guilty of the, of the things that people on this committee and others in the press accused him of. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's secondary. That's secondary. If primary the gentleman's time has expired, here, could you get to primary? The primary is the changes that have been made at ATF, because ultimately the primary objective here was to pay respect to Brian Ter Terry's service to this country and to his family. And so, so can you tell me whether the, the reforms to ATF that would prevent another agent who puts on the uniform for this country and serves this country could be protected now because of the changes that have been adopted by the ATF so that something like this doesn't happen uh, to, to another uh, American in service of his country on the, on the Customs and Border Patrol. Gentlemen's time has expired, but please answer. Uh, ATF steps, as we indicated, are important first steps. We thought there needed to be additional steps taken, and we've recommended those, and we will follow up to make sure those are put in place. Thank you. And the gentleman's other question about uh, people informing or should have informed uh, the Attorney General or, or the other up, I think he'd like to have an answer to the up chain failure. Yeah. And, and we found, as we outlined in the report, we struggle to understand how an operation of this size, of this importance, that impacted another country like it did, could not have been briefed up to the Attorney General of the United States. Um, it should have been, in our view. It was that kind of a case. Okay. Thank you. We now go to I the gentleman. The indulgence. Thank you. Of course. We now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Horowitz, for, for your continuing good work on behalf of the Department of Justice and certainly uh, the, the United States of America. Uh, you couldn't have teed off my questioning any better than asking about the failure to report this up the chain. I'm going back to an April 12th. Uh, th this is an email uh, that comes from uh, Deputy Attorney General Weinstein and it, it's it, with respect to 
a prosecution memo that he gets on Operation Wide Receiver. And these are his words. I'm stunned based on what we've had to make sure, had to do to make sure that not even a single operable weapon walked in undercover, undercover operations I've been involved in planning. I think we need to make sure we go over these issues with our front office. We owe it to ATF headquarters to preview these issues before anything gets filed. So let me ask a predicate question. With complete knowledge that guns had been walked, that there were implications that had been crimes committed in, in Mexico based on a prior activity, did you ever ask why they continued to prosecute that case and send agents and actually reinvigorated that investigation and prosecution on the prior bad act? Um, I'd have to go back and check the transcript on exactly what was asked and what was answered, and I'm happy to do that. I do think it's evident from the email traffic that we looked at, which was a belief that uh, this was a good case. There were people that they had evidence on, but that there would be the possibility of embarrassing the agency by press stories about the gun watch. So we're more worried about embarrassing agencies than we are about the public safety and issues of that nature. That, uh, from our standpoint, that appeared to be the outcome of that meeting that happened just two weeks later, um, which was about managing what the public's reaction might be to learning about gun walk. But notice specifically what I find about this statement is, is, is in his own words, the degree to which uh, Mr. Weinstein uh, believes that there is a responsibility to inquire with regard to uh, an, an investigation. So now let's move forward a little bit to, to the, you know, the next matter in which uh, he's now in charge of, of the oversight of uh, the Fast and Furious, and there are certainly communications uh, that take place with regard to certain of uh, higher level individuals who are engaged in the in the um, review of information uh, and, and, and others. What responsibilities did he have at that point in time to inquire as to the activities that may have taken place during Fast and Furious? appreciating that by his own language he had already understood first that the ATF had already engaged in this kind of activity improperly and second his own articulation that even a single gun being walked was a violation of what he considered to be his sense of a properly run case and third his own desire to assure that inquiries were made well, what occurred is in that late April into May time period, uh, af in connection with or immediately after the discussion he had about wide receiver and the gun walking in wide receiver, he learned information about Fast and Furious. Perhaps not gun walking was going on, but he learned information about the case sufficient enough to write an email to the head of the internal office of the Justice Department that handles wiretaps to refer to it as the most or one of the most important cases involving the U.S.-Mexico trafficking activity. He then, and he did that in the context of trying to ensure the wiretap applications were being reviewed promptly. He then, two weeks later, had one of those wiretap applications land on his desk for approval. He indicated to us he never read it. He only read the cover memo. As we indicate in our report, we thought there was sufficient evidence and information, even in the cover memo, to warrant him to, to inquire into that affidavit. We go back. I thank you for your language, because this is his language. This is perhaps the most significant Mexico-related firearms trafficking investigation ATF has going. So he knew not only that, but the importance and the significance of it. Where is the duty to inquire with regard to, you have noticed, now we know as attorneys under the tort law, people are being sued all over the United States because they had prior notice of a condition, failed to act, and now they're being responsible because subsequently somebody else has been harmed. I've already identified the standards that this particular individual had, and we know he has explicit information about prior activities of this sort. We know that there is information that's contained within, according to your report, the affidavits of probable cause that he's responsible for reviewing, maybe not incomplete, but the failure to inquire and the communications that take place between he and Brewer and one more in which there's this, well, I judged from his effectively demeanor 
that, 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 that he understood when he was talking to the ATF? I, I, where is the duty to inquire that would have led to a clear articulation of what was going on with Operation Fast and Furious? And that, I think, is a very important question and precisely the reason why we have the recommendation in the report about deputy AAGs needing to review the affidavits. They're not looking at it just as robotic uh, lawyers to check a box about is this statutory purpose met, is another statutory purpose met. Deputy AAGs are SES, members of the SES. They're involved in policy issues. They have an appreciation or should have an appreciation of broader issues. And if they notice a problem, their obligation, I believe, as a deputy AAG, is to then ask follow-up questions. Mr. Horowitz, you, you, get, you get the ability, I'm running out of time, you get the ability to be, which, which, is, which I think you did well. You're, you're judge, jury, fact finder, and, and writer of the opinion. So you're able to classify things in a variety of different ways. Is it your opinion that Mr. Weinstein should have specifically and unambiguously questioned whether there were improper tactics on Fast and Furious that mirrored those that had taken place in the prior operation? We found there was sufficient information in the cover memo he saw to either ask questions or to go into the affidavit and read it, which would have triggered, in our view, more red flags. I thank the gentleman. I thank you for that line of questioning. We now go to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your work. We appreciate all your staff and the extraordinary amount of work that took place here. Um, you're talking a little bit about the uh, wiretap analysis. Is it your sense in talking and they thought this was the, because of the sheer volume that the junior level people were only reading the summaries of, of these wiretap applications? That's what we had heard, which is the sheer volume of wiretap applications that came before deputy AAGs with all the other items they needed to deal with that they could rely on the memos from their subordinates, which we're not taking issue with the thoroughness of the memos that they received, um, but that was what we had heard. But the memos, the, the summaries weren't, an, were the summaries enough to create red flags in your mind, or with the actual wiretap applications, the full body? Well, in our view, the, the summary memo that was received um, by Mr. Weinstein given what had just occurred within the prior few weeks regarding wide receiver, was were sufficient, in our view, to trigger him to inquire further. But, but and, and going I, back to your point of, of, of avoiding this in the future, which is what right. we should really be about, um, unless there's something like you just described that triggers a, a more thorough analysis, how do you get through the volume that we talk about here in all these cases and in many more instances across the country and other scenarios that you can only imagine so that you know what is it you have to do take a random number of a t particular type and do a more thorough analysis to see if there's something more significant there no i think in our view in each instance the congress has authorized what is a very intrusive law enforcement technique, electronically wiretapping an individual's phone or other uh, personal device. Congress put very tight strictures on that. That is a Fourth Amendment right that is being invaded. In our view, in each instance, a Deputy Assistant Attorney General, which is the person to whom the statute Congress has given authority to uh, authorize that intrusion, should look at the, each affidavit in a manner sufficient to allow them to perform a personal judgment on whether they are comfortable that that application, that affidavit, meets the statutory criteria. And we, we recognize that the level of scrutiny they give to the affidavit can well be informed by what they read in the memo their staff has provided to them, but that they can't and shouldn't just rely on that staff memo. But again, back to your own experience in this, the sheer volume alone, is, is the staffing sufficient? Well, certainly there can always be more staffing, and the volume has grown since I was in the, the criminal division 12 years ago. So I understand why there may be need for more resources, but I think regardless of whether there's a need for more resources, in our view, this is such a significant event that is being authorized that 
this deserves among the highest priorities. Uh, let me skip to another point. In your analysis, this, what is your estimate of the total number of guns that were walked under both administrations? Um, as we put in the report, rough estimate in Fast and Furious was about 2,000. Rough estimate in uh, wide receiver was about 400. That's total guns. Uh, there were about 100 firearms in each case. Sure. Uh, me, that were interdicted by ATF. But, but in now analyzing this as much as you did and analyzing what Agent Forcelli said that uh, straw purchasers are punished about like a moving violation when he testified before this committee, uh, your best guess in reviewing these applications of the number of guns that are transported through straw purchases? Uh, I'm sorry, the number of guns that are that are uh, they go to Mexico due to straw purchases? Well, we did a report in Project Gunrunner uh, a couple of years ago that outlined the significant flow of firearm trafficking. So there is a substantial flow of But the get, your guess in numbers I, annually, I thousands and thousands and thousands? As I sit here, I'm sorry, I don't have that. Yeah, I mean, but best guesses are, are and this is a tragedy, and, and that's what we're about. But if the concern is, as the chairman said earlier, to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous criminals, this issue isn't going to stop today because straw purchases are happening today. And as the agent who testified in front of this committee said, they're not punished any more than doing 65 in a 50. I know because of your hard work you appreciate this, but you, it cannot be lost upon you, sir, that the fact is we're, we haven't solved this problem if thousands the numbers dwarfing what happened in this tragedy are still taking place. Now, clearly, as we outlined in, in our previous report in Project Gunrunner, there's a need to take serious action, uh, law enforcement action, to, to address this problem. I thank agree. you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I only ask you to maybe correct your statement or, uh, about one thing. You used the word interdicted. Do you mean recovered or interdicted when you said 100 weapons in each? I'm sorry. There were... I'm I, limiting that to ATF interdictions of two, 100 out of 2,000. Were, were recovered were or recovered? Recovered. I'm sorry. 100 interdicted or stopped by ATF. Many additional recovered at crime scenes or in other locations, but only 100 in total of the 2,000. And, and just to, because I think the gentleman's point was very good, when you're using that term, it's a term where they lost control but then regained control. Oh, 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 it, in some instances, that's the case. And it, it's hard to generalize on the 100 because there were several different events that occurred as to how they got them, some of which I actually can't even talk about because it is still under. And I appreciate that, and I just think that this committee has spent an inordinate amount of time, as is judiciary, in trying to define what gun walking is. Right. And, you know, if you grab them before they lose your control, we generally believe those are, that's not gun walking. And if you deliberately allow it to leave your control, that is gun walking. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, the, op the, the definition we operated under generally was you have an opportunity to interdict and a legal basis to do so, and you don't. A great standard. It should be the standard, I thank the gentleman. We now go to the former chairman of the full committee, uh, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on page 455 of your report, uh, you refer to uh, Lanny Brewer failing to report the gun walking to the uh, Deputy Attorney General. And uh, you say, we believe Brewer should have promptly informed the Deputy Attorney General or the Attorney General about the matter in April 2010, and he failed to do so. Uh, the question I have is the public relations office over there uh, I guess the lady's name is Tracy Schmaller. Uh, on June the 5th, she said, the committee also knows full well that Assistant Attorney General Lanny Brewer did not review the wiretap applications in Fast and Furious. That does not stop the committee, however, from falsely asserting that Brewer was responsible for authorizing them. There's a real inconsistency there. And the, the last part of my question is, I understand that uh, there's a media matters. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with what that is. Uh, this Ms. Schmaller evidently sent an email to them about somebody that uh, uh, ought to be uh, in investigated or ought to get a little pressure put on them. 
Uh, are you familiar with any of that? Um, I've read the reports and I've seen them. I have not looked at it, uh, Congressman, beyond that at this point. So that was not involved at all in your... The, the reason I ask is if, if this kind of an email was sent for, I guess, Justin Phillips, uh, were, were any other emails sent to Media Matters about uh, the chairman or members of this committee who were conducting the investigation? Because she was pretty uh, vocal and vociferous when she said uh, on June 5th, the committee also knows full well that Assistant Attorney General Lanny Brewer, Brewer did not review the wiretap applications in Fast and Furious. And then she went on to say, that does not stop the committee, however, from falsely asserting Brewer was responsible for authorizing them. And, and uh, if, if this example of going to media matters about this Mr. Phillips is, is a, a, a way that, that they normally do things over there in the Public Relations Department, I was concerned that maybe they were trying to do that to, to members of this committee that were working so hard on the investigation or possibly the chairman, but you have no knowledge of that. I, I don't know about the interaction between Office of Public Affairs and Media Matters other than what I've read in the press in the last few days uh, about it. Okay, thank you very much. I, I'll yield them to the chairman. I think the gentleman, and speaking of retaliation against the uh, uh, the administration's enemies or the uh, attorney generals, uh, if uh, if in fact federal funds are used in order to uh, dissuade members of Congress or members of the uh, judiciary branch, that would be a violation of the law, wouldn't it? You're not allowed to use federal funds to essentially try to attack your political opponents. Uh, that's kind of a no-no, isn't it? That's my understanding. That IG 101. Well. Uh, to that extent, I'd like to talk to you about the whistleblowers. Uh, as you said in your opening statement, and I think both sides of the aisle have called them courageous, uh, have you, uh, your report does not spend much time discussing whistleblowers who, ex who expose fast and furious, uh, although you do mention it. Uh, have you been able to determine whether the whistleblowers uh, have in fact been dealt with fairly and protected under the Whistleblowers Act? Uh, that is a matter, as we indicated in the report, we are still finalizing and reviewing, and um, I agree, Mr. Chairman, the um, efforts of the ATF agents in this case to come forward and acknowledge what was not public. And having done law enforcement cases in the Southern District of New York, it takes uh, a lot of courage to come forward if you're in a law enforcement agency and explain what the agency has done wrong. And in your report, have you, would you feel that you have vindicated the whistleblowers? In other words, initially when Dobson and others came forward, they were, they were accused of, in fact, false allegations, et cetera. Would you say that at the end of your investigation, those 471 pages, um, as succinct as it is, pretty well does a job of, of vindicating their concerns that they raised publicly? It, it certainly, from my standpoint, um, and there were a lot of people who came forward, so let me right. I, just I say, realize it's a broad group now. It's, uh, you know, the, the folks who came forward, the agents who came forward and said guns were being walked and they could have had an implication in Agent Terry's death, which is what some of the earliest information was on the Internet, um, and more publicly beyond that, um, I think it's pretty clear that that's what happened here, is that guns were walked in quite a substantial way. Now, notwithstanding the fact that uh, Brian Terry had to be gunned down uh, for them to come forward in large and in ever increasing numbers, wasn't this an example of exactly why whistleblowers are to be protected and why whistleblowers should be encouraged to come forward sooner rather than later? Uh, and, and I want to particularly mention ones who are not looking for a key TAM case, but in fact are truly just trying to get something bad stopped. I, I agree. I think this is an example of the importance of uh, employees in all parts of the, uh, the government, uh, in this case law enforcement, to come forward if they have information and be comfortable doing that. And that is one of the reasons, as you know, I've put in place a whistleblower ombudsman position in my office because of this and other events that I've seen that people need to be comfortable to come forward and talk and we need to do a good job of following up on their concerns. Well, I want to thank you and I, I want to particularly thank you for the fact that more whistleblowers go to IGs. IGs run down more of these problems by far than Congress ever does. So we often get noted when whistleblowers come to us, but most of the cases that we see 
come through your offices when whistleblowers have come within the agency. Uh, and with that, I would note that uh, one of the UCs uh, that will be on the floor today will, in fact, uh, be a whistleblower reform. So uh, uh, there couldn't be a better time to remind the members of Congress that uh, we defend, do depend on whistleblowers and we need to protect them. With that, I'm pleased to go to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Inspector General. Um, I want to thank you for your very informative and clarifying information. I think what you have delineated gives the average citizen a great deal of confidence that what they are hearing is what has actually happened. I know that Lanny Brewer, the head of the criminal division at the Department of Justice, has been severely criticized by some members of Congress for what they consider to be his actions here. Senator Grassley has called for his resignation. The chairman of this committee has said, Mr. Brewer, and I quote, clearly had culpability. And Mr. Schaefer has even said that Mr. Brewer started this up in 2009. So I want to ask you a few questions to see if we can't really clarify and understand what Mr. Brewer's role in these two programs were. One, Mr. Horwitz, did you find that Assistant Attorney General Brewer authorized or directed gun walking in either Operation Fast and Furious or Wide Receiver? Uh, we did not. Did you find that Mr. Brewer reviewed or approved the wiretap applications in either operation? No. Uh, in each of the 14 instances, it was a Deputy Assistant Attorney General who authorized uh, the applications. Did you find any evidence that Mr. Brewer was aware that gun walking occurred in Operation Fast and Furious before the information became public? Uh, prior to Senator Grassley's letter, uh, we did not find information that he was aware of gun walking in Operation Fast and Furious. It was only with regard to wide receiver that we were aware of that information. In April 2010, Mr. Brewer did learn about the gun walking tactics that had been used during the Bush administration in Operation Wide Receiver but only after the operation had been completed. So, Mr. Horwitz, what did Mr. Brewer do when he learned that gun walking occurred in Operation Wide Receiver? Um, what we were told by um, Mr. Brewer and Mr. Weinstein and perhaps others that we interviewed was uh, that uh, there would be a meeting with ATF at and at that meeting, um, ATF would be told that the gun walking tactics were unacceptable. We found that um, there was no, however, admonishing at the meeting. Mr. Brewer was not at that meeting, but we found that there was no, in fact, admonishing of ATF for that conduct. What additional steps, if there were any, do you think Mr. Brewer should have taken when he learned that gun walking occurred in Operation Wide Receiver? Well, as indicated, one of the things we sought out to do here was address the facts that we found and not go beyond those. And in this case, we found he knew about Wide Receiver in April of 2010. He did not have direct authority over ATF. It was the Deputy Attorney General and the Attorney General who had authority. Those tactics were unacceptable, and he should have told the two people, one or, other, or both of the people who could have taken action to stop or to correct what was happening. Mr. Brewer testified publicly before Congress, has acknowledged and apologized for his oversight, and explained that he regretted the fact that he did not raise concerns about Operation Wide Receiver with other senior leaders at the Department of Justice. Chairman Issa has also alleged that Mr. Brewer was actively advocating gun walking to the Mexican government. As 
evidence for this claim, Chairman Issa points to notes from a meeting with senior officials from Mexican government on February 2nd, 2011, that stated that Mr. Brewer discussed controlled deliveries. Here's what the note said, and I quote, Mr. Brewer suggested allowing straw purchases to cross into Mexico so the Mexican Federal Police Force can and arrest the Mexican Attorney General's Office can prosecute and convict. Such coordinated operation between the United States and Mexico may send a strong message to arms traffickers. Mr. Horowitz, in your report, you draw a sharp distinction. I'd ask the unanimous consent, sit content, con, the unanimous consent, the gentleman have an additional minute without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you draw a sharp distinction between gun walking and controlled deliveries. Do you consider advocating for coordinated operation with Mexico to be the same as advocating for gun walking? Uh, we found, as you noted in our report, that controlled deliveries are different from gun walking. And we would draw a distinction between the two, and a distinction was drawn between the two for us by a number of witnesses. I thank you very much for your testimony. And I would the gentleman yield for? Yes. Uh, isn't it true that wide receiver, as an intent, stated was a controlled delivery. The, the actual gun walking that occurred was when agents abandoned their watch of the weapons for any number of reasons, including they'd been there for hours, they were tired, they went home. But the actual program that uh, Attorney General, uh, Assistant Attorney General Brewer was advocating, in fact, reads right on what was wide receiver. It, and in wide receiver, there first was a failure to interdict, then there was this effort of controlled deliveries, and then there was a failure again. And the controlled deliveries that, as I understand it, and we did not investigate this further, that Mr. Brewer had talked about um, in February of 2011, was an effort to do coordinated uh, uh, interdiction with Mexican authorities. That was stopped by the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General's order a few weeks later. But in fact, if he had succeeded and they'd gone to do it, they'd have been essentially repeating a history of something that had failed, the, the trans-border crossing interdiction. Right. Well, they clearly failed in wide receiver, and I guess, as with all things, the devil's in the details as to how the, the plan of action would be. So I'm, I'm hesitant to speculate as to what the outcome would be, but that was the idea in wide receiver, was to try and do an effective controlled delivery, which never happened. Thank you. Thank the gentleman for yielding. We now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ra uh, Mr. Labrador, who is not from Florida but from Idaho, or wherever I'm from, right? But you're only your own. <laughs> we, we could go on and on, but but you know you're just lucky Ross was out of the room. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, good morning. Thanks for being here, and I thank you for your report. I I think it's very thorough and. Um, you know, this morning and yesterday, we've heard a lot of media reports about how this is a vindication for Mr. Holder. And you've already said that you're not going to go there. You're, you're just going to let the report speak for itself. But I find it fascinating that the only way some of the people here and in the media are saying that this is a vindication for Mr. Holder is by creating a straw man argument. They're saying that what this committee was investigating was whether Mr. Holder knew or participated in Fast and Furious from the beginning. That's a straw man argument. We never, we didn't know what Mr. Holder knew. And why didn't we know? Because he came to Congress on several occasions and he misled Congress. Whether it was intentional or whether it was unintentional, the facts in your report show that he, on several occasions, didn't tell the truth to Congress. Isn't that true? We don't draw a conclusion as to his testimony to Congress. I think that, obviously, is for the members. But, but in the letters that were sent from the Attorney General's office twice, right, memos, those, the statements in those memos were either misleading or false. Isn't that correct? We didn't look at that as part of our review, uh, Congressman, so I'm, I'm not in a position today to speak to the representations to Congress in those letters. No, in, in the memos that in were the sent. Memos. The letters you, you have on, um, 
He, he st stated on May 3rd, Holder testified, well, you didn't look at the statements, but he did give two memos to, con to Congress through his office. Mm -hmm. There were two specific memos that were given to co Congress that had to be retracted. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of that, mm -hmm. um, Congressman. Uh, again, we didn't question the department about what they did or didn't provide to Congress. Okay. Uh, would the gentleman yield for just a second? Yesterday in the briefing, you might want to check with your, your own staff, we were talking about the February 4th, which was later corrected, and the May 2nd, I believe. Okay. Uh, I, I, those, sorry, two, I, those two you do have an opinion on, right? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I, when the, the reference to memo, I was confused. Yeah, I know. I apologize. We'll call I'm them letters. Sorry. Yeah, the letters. Uh, okay. So let's call them letters. Yes, I'm sorry about that. You, you're aware of the two letters, correct? correct? The February 4th and the May correct. 2nd letter. And those had to be retracted. The February uh, 4th letter was retracted. I think, as the committee's own report indicated, as to the May 2nd letter, there is an argument that it is literally true. Mm -hmm. um, but that is what, in part, troubled us as we wrote. And, and you wrote in your report that that troubled you because correct. it was literally true. But it, uh, you, I don't know that you used the word misleading, but it could, it could mislead. So let me just ask you a simple question, how, and, and really quickly tell me, how much time, how many, how many people do you have on your staff working on this report? Um, I don't know the number precisely because so many people had worked on it for 18 months, but it was, it was, I'm guessing north of 20, but I'm, it would be a pure guess. How many man hours do you think were spent on this report? The good news is I wasn't here for the first 13 months, so okay. I, <laughs> I can't tell you. The last six, five months, I can tell you there were a lot of man hours. Uh, it's been, I, I actually don't know the exact. And, and as we just heard from Mr. Lynch, uh, your report is so long that it might encourage some people not to read it. You, we have over 451 pages in, in your report. Do you think your time spent on this report, your time spent investigating this, would have been necessary had the Department of Justice provided this Congress the same information that they provided to you in your investigation? That, that would be hard to speculate on. I think, I, I will say this, regardless of what had happened along the way, I think the facts of wide receiver and fast and furious, the work we did was important to bring out and address. The agents brought forward very significant information before the letter writing that occurred that you've referenced. So I think our, we would have probably spent a lot of hours on it. Our timing might, our time might have been different. Obviously, Chapter 6 in our report would have changed. And, and in your investigation, you said you were a Deputy Attorney General before. And in, in your time, you are always asking the question, what does somebody know about an investigation? What does somebody know about what you're investigating? The things, all we were trying to get to is the bottom line of what the Attorney General knew what his department knew, and we spent countless hours here trying to figure that out. And in your report, it says that they should have done a better job. I just find it fascinating that people are trying to exonerate anybody of any wrongdoing when clearly there's been blissful ignorance, there's been blissful avoidance of the truth, and I just think it's uh, time for us to get to the bottom line of what happened here. I really thank you for your report. I thank you for your time, and I thank you for uh, doing the job that, that we asked you to do. Thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Barber. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to sit in on this hearing. And I also want to thank you for coming to Arizona this week uh, when we gathered to honor Brian uh, and to have a station, a Border Patrol station, named for him. Uh, this young man sacrificed the ultimate sacrifice for our country. And your presence there, I think, gave um, uh, the family a sense that the Congress was concerned and was trying to do their best to find answers to the questions that they have. I've talked with the family. And when I met with them this week, they had one question and one request from us. They asked that we make sure that they get the information that they have been waiting for that's been on their minds and in their hearts for 21 months. To me, it's outrageous that they haven't gotten the answer sooner. They want to know what happened to Brian, why were guns that were allowed to go into Mexico with the full knowledge of personnel in the federal government and that ultimately uh, ended up at the, at the scene of his murder in Rio Rico, Arizona. 
They want to know who made the decision to launch Fast and Furious. They want to know who is, should be held accountable for these decisions and what the consequences they will face. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, I want to thank you and your staff for what is obviously a tremendous amount of work um, in preparing this report. It's, in my view, uh, a report that has uh, tremendous credibility and objectivity. And I think, finally, the Terry family is beginning, but just beginning, to get the answers they deserve that are long overdue. But I don't believe they have yet received the answers to all of their questions, and I'd like to address those in just a moment. Um, Agent Terry, as we know, made the ultimate sacrifice for his country. Nothing we can do uh, will bring him back, but he and his family deserve to know what happened and who was responsible. Your findings prove that serious flaws in policy and inadequate oversight and flagrant disregard for public safety allowed American weapons to fall in the hands of violent Mexican criminals and drug cartel members as a part of Operation Fast and Furious. It should never have been the policy of this government to allow farm, uh, these firearms to be smuggled knowingly into Mexico, and the program should never have been proved, and it must never happen again. So I have a question or two for you, Mr. Horowitz. Um, you said that steps have been taken um, already to prevent a reoccurrence. Can you say specifically a couple of those steps that you believe uh, will prevent a reoccurrence that are already in place? Um, well, as we've put in uh, our report, the ATF has instituted a variety of uh, restrictions on when this type of activity can occur. So that's first. Second, there have been put, there have now been put in place steps to require various levels of supervisory review that didn't exist before. And so, for example, those are two that ATF has done as identified. We've we've suggested others and a more thorough review of the policies and practices to make sure others are caught, such as uh, requiring ATF to abide by the undercover operation rules that the Attorney General has in place. Thank you for that. I, I, the family believes, and I agree with them, uh, that they may well have been deliberately kept in the dark about uh, uh, Brian's death and the circumstances surrounding it. Did your investigation reveal that this was discussed within the department uh, and why it was not determined that the family should know more sooner? Um, I don't recall us seeing evidence of discussion specifically about what to tell the Terry family. Um, I'd have to go back and refresh myself on that, but I don't recall that being the basis, if that was occurring, that that was what was being discussed in the emails we saw. And one more question in the remaining time. We have heard that there were internal disputes uh, within the Department of Justice at the field level that allowed Fast and Furious uh, to walk guns into Mexico, specifically that there was a dispute between the ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, can you speak to what you found regarding this issue, please? Yes, that's a very important issue that we take on and address because there has been the suggestion from agents that, well, they couldn't seize or take action because the U.S. Attorney's Office had a restrictive view on what they could do or not do. That was an issue and that was a concern in other cases. What we found here in Fast and Furious was that didn't exist. From the outset, both the U.S. Attorney's Office and the agents at ATF decided they wanted to get to the top of the organization and the way to do that was to take no action as to the straw purchasers. It wasn't, in our view, a, a legal problem an issue about the evidence. It was a tactical decision that was made by both entities. I want to thank you for your testimony. Uh, would the gentleman yield, Mr. Chairman? Uh, would the gentleman yield for just a quick question? Please. Uh, you, you've commented several times on this bottom up, the agents deciding to do it. In your opinion, your, your staff's opinion, was, a, was any part of it, if you will, the arrogance and ambition, the our job, we're, our job is limited to we go after guns, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, but basically guns. And this, they ran up the chain of drugs and drug cartels. 
by this ambition that they were going to roll up people and entities that were well outside their basic jurisdiction. Was there any sort of a feeling by your people that this was the exuberance of ambition? I'm going to get a big hit and I'm going to move up and I'm going to be director at the ATF or something like that? Well, I think um, there was a concern that we saw about a desire early on, for example, to go for a wiretap. That's generally thought of as a very sophisticated technique and shows sophistication in a case. Even though we found there was all this evidence, thousands of guns, by that point, hundreds of guns, lots of cash from people who had no income. And so the question was, why not take, take action then, but instead focus on the wiretap? So that concerned us. Another concern, and perhaps evidence of that thinking, although we didn't, no one, of course, told us that was a reason. And yeah, no one ever brags about their right. ambition. Right. Uh, as shocking as that may be. Um, but the, the, right at the outset, the effort to keep ICE out of the case. As indicated, their emails right away in November, at the outset of this, we got to keep ICE at bay. Don't have them investigate. Well, they have an important piece of the law enforcement effort in gun trafficking at the border. And you can't take that position if you want to be effective at the border, in my estimation. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, Mr. Inspector General. I, I apologize if I sound terse or hostile. I'm a huge fan of the uh, Inspector General program. think it's a great asset. But there do remain some questions that I've gotten in my office about, is this investigation just the fox guarding the hen house? I think your report does, uh, does go into great depth, in, but I, I do want to hit the outlines of it and some things that may lead to where we need to go further in this committee in continuing to investigate fast and furious. So, uh, my, my first question is the Supreme Court has made uh, very clear with respect to executive privilege there's not an unqualified presidential privilege. The deliberative process privilege requires that the protective material be both limited to communications occurring before the policy adoption and deliberately reflecting the process by which the policy alternatives are assessed at the highest level. As you, have, uh, as you know, the President has claimed executive privilege to a broad group of documents this committee has subpoenaed, uh, some of which I imagine that you looked at in your investigation. You've had uh, access to thousands more documents uh, than we have. My first question is roughly how many of these documents, in your opinion, would be covered by executive privilege? Um, Congressman, we fortunately didn't have to make a decision about what we thought was or was not within executive privilege because our decision right at the outset was to ask for all the documents that we needed. We got them and to include them in the report. Right, but y'all looked at them. It, it we looked at everything. Gut, gut feeling, then, if you can't answer specifically. Were there some in there covered by executive privilege? I, I don't know that. Uh, that is that was never our call. We were never shared any okay. with any information about that. All right. You noted also in your report that the White House refused to share internal uh, communications with you during your investigation of Fast and Furious. We've noted a connection into the White House through Kevin O'Reilly at the National Security Council. Do you think the White House's refusal to share these documents uh, uh, limited the scope of your investigation? And this, would this committee be uh, well served by uh, pursuing an investigation in that avenue? Well, as we noted in the report, and as you know, Congressman, we did not get internal communications from the White House, and Mr. O'Reilly's unwillingness to speak to us made it impossible for us to pursue that angle of the, of the case and the question that had been raised. Yeah, so it, might, it would probably be worthwhile for us to uh, pursue. Well, certainly we uh, have sought to pursue every lead we could. So um, I, I can just tell you okay. from our standpoint, it was a lead we wanted to follow. Thank you very much. And uh, is, is Mr. Barton... Uh, pointed out, I'm sorry, Mr. Burton pointed out, um, the DOJ has been accused of cooperating with outside groups like Media and Matters for advice and uh, spin on stories uh, so they'll come out in a positive manner. And I imagine the uh, press office and all of the uh, DOJ is concerned about that. It actually kind of troubles me that there is such a political uh, facet to what goes on in the DOJ of all the executive agencies you would hope DOJ would be the one most above uh, politics but my question is do you know if the DOJ uh, shared this report prior to its release yesterday with any outside groups or uh, and or who within the DOJ uh, that might would have made substantive changes to the report um. we provided for purposes of our comment and review a draft of the report to the department 
we allowed the department internally to share it with people who had relevant information, but to tightly control who saw it and that it was not to be shared outside the Okay, department. so the best of your knowledge, Media Matters didn't vet this. They should not have, and if they had been allowed to see it would have been a violation of the understanding that we had about the review. All right, great. Now, um, I've been approached by commentators and constituents alike uh, who question possible uh, political motives behind allowing something like Operation Fast and Furious uh, to continue. You know, some of them have claimed that uh, there may have been a, a desire at some levels to create a public outcry uh, for stricter gun laws. Uh, would your investigation have been able to uncover uh, political motives behind allowing the operation uh, to continue and uh, did it or is the uh, entire fiasco a result of just gross mismanagement? Um, we did look at that issue and that question to see if we had documents or other evidence uh, on that point. Um, we didn't obviously go into the investigation looking for the motive specifically but we did think it was important to address it. We do highlight in the report those instances where there's talk about perhaps changing rules, regulations, or laws. What we found is all of those incidents came after the investigation had begun. So the notion was, well, maybe this is a good example to show why we need to change the laws. But we didn't find evidence at the outset that that was what was driving. Did you find evidence that at any point where the, process, the Fast and Furious operation was in effect that uh, this was happening? There, there was suggestion later on in the investigation that it might be a good example to show why rules, laws, regulations might be, uh, as an example of why they might need to be changed. I, I see my time has expired. Would the gentleman yield? Certainly. So to characterize, they were opportunistic after the fact, but you found no evidence that before the fact that they did Operation Fast and Furious in order to get laws changed. Well, correct. In the, in the documents we reviewed, we did not see the at the outset. In fact, the documents we saw indicate at the outset the notion was let's not take action to get to the top simply because they wanted to get to the top. Is Fast and Furious 2,000 weapons being knowingly allowed to walk and leading to the death of Brian Terry, is that a good poster child for why you need to have tighter rules uh, on gun dealers since gun dealers were in fact ordered or coerced into participating in this rather than listening to them when they say this guy's a straw buyer and arresting him? Well, we, you know, we found that in terms of a law enforcement technique um, or law, enf law enforcement tactics that the uh, decision making that justified what was going on just failed in the primary mission of law enforcement, which was to protect the public. I thank the gentleman. Oh, I thank the IG and I thank the gentleman. We now go to that splendid individual from the great state of Missouri for his questions and probing. With that, Mr. Clay is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm so glad to be back after the August break and to get right down to business. So let me, um, Mr. Chairman, I think we can all agree that gun walking, whether during Operation Wide Receiver or Operation Fast and Furious, uh, was an incredibly reckless tactic that put both American and Mexican lives at risk. Uh, in February, the Attorney General testified before this committee that the department had removed, reassigned, or accepted the resignation of a number of people within ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Phoenix uh, that had operational oversight of Operation Fast and Furious, including the acting ATF Director Ken Melson and U.S. Attorney for Phoenix, Dennis Burke. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, it is my understanding that ATF has been under new leadership since August of last year when the Attorney General announced the appointment of B. Todd Jones, a former military prosecutor and U.S. Attorney for the District of Minnesota, to serve as Acting Director of ATF. Is that correct? That's my understanding, Congressman. Uh, and the Attorney General also stated on several occasions that he was waiting for the release of your final report to make final determinations about further personnel actions. Uh, is it consistent with prior practice for agency leadership to reserve certain personnel actions regarding individuals 
under investigation for alleged misconduct until there is an Inspector General report. Well, since I'm only five months in the job, Congressman, I'll, uh, I'm not sure I can speak to the experience. So, so you, you're not clear on the history? I don't know no. what in prior instances where my office has done reviews, okay. um, what different approaches might have been taken, if any. Well, you know, your, your report not only makes policy recommendations for the Department of Justice, but also assessed, and I quote, the performance of each of the department employees who were most involved in Operation Wide Receiver and Operation Fast and Furious. Uh, several media outlets have reported that you recommended individuals for discipline by the Attorney General. Mr. Horowitz, did your office make any specific personnel recommendation in light of Operation Wide Receiver and Operation Fast and Furious? Uh, no, we simply reported on the facts of what we found and where we thought there were failures or other issues related to the performance, but not made specific recommendations as to what should or shouldn't happen. As and, and is that common practice to not uh, make recommendations on uh, personnel? Uh, again, being fairly new in the job, my understanding is uh, that in, uh, on occasions there may be instances where we have in the past, so I'm not, I'm not sure I can speak to the, the history of that. Okay. Um, yesterday, the Attorney General announced that former acting ATF Director Melson is retiring and that Deputy Assistant Attorney General Jason Weinstein has resigned. Uh, the Attorney General also stated that there may be more personnel actions for career employees at ATF and the Phoenix U.S. Attorney's Office although for Privacy Act reasons he cannot disclose them at this time. He stated, and I quote, those individuals within ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Arizona, whom the OIG report found to have been responsible for designing, implementing, or supervising Operation Fast and Furious, have been referred to the appropriate entities for review and consideration of potential personnel actions. Consistent with the requirements of the Privacy Act, the Department is prohibited from revealing any additional information about these referrals at this time. Uh, and and Mr. Mr. Chairman, you know, um, looking at, at how this is all developed, uh, it, uh, it gives me pause and makes me wonder. Um, did this committee shoot from the hip? Did we move too soon? I mean, I'm, that's just food for thought. Would the gentleman yield? For you, for you, Mr. Chairman, and the rest of the committee who voted so recklessly uh, uh, when it was time to, to uh, take action against our attorney general. I yield. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I might note that uh, contempt was narrow it was for the Attorney General's refusal to give us the very documents that the IG re required in order to do this very comprehensive report. I would say just the opposite, that contempt was most appropriate in retrospect when, in fact, the very documents we now know and are applauding in this report were the documents denied us. Well, before you, before you, time, came, before you came in, in my time. Which, of course, uh, the, this, this report seems very thorough. What is it, about 1,400 pages? It seems like he got the <laughs> OIG, got all of the, uh, the information. We, previ we previously it, uh, noted it, that it is it, thorough at the minimum possible number of well, pages. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, and I, uh, I guess we are going to agree to continue to disagree on this. Uh, I wish you had been here earlier when the IG was explaining that he did need the documents he got and was happy to have them and felt that we should have gotten them too. And better late than never. Well, Jason Weinstein should have resigned a year and a half ago. The house cleaning should have happened a year and a half ago uh, if in fact justice was going to have good judgment sooner rather than later. But I respect the gentleman's uh, d desire to disagree and I thank him. Now we go to a gentleman with whom I am more likely to agree at the moment, the distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lankford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yes, it would have been nice to have all these same documents that you had access to when we asked for them a very long time ago. 
Uh, I think a lot of people have asked these same questions and just wanted some answers. Uh, so thank you for your work and thank you for pulling that together. And I, I look forward to our committee continuing to work uh, to be able to finish our reports out as well and uh, hopefully have access to those same documents. Uh, let's get to the issue of fixing it. So one of my primaries when the Attorney General was here, uh, he and I had a conversation about how do we resolve this. Uh, the issue of putting out a statement that gun walking is now forbidden of any type. We won't, we'll interdict weapons every time. Okay, great. That's a first step. But there are multiple other issues we start dealing with fixing it. Uh, things like uh, the supervision of the process of investigations is very different for the FBI than it is for ATF. And my basic question is why? Uh, why does FBI have one process supervising investigations? ATF has a very, very different process on that. It's overseen by the same DOJ. Uh, why do we have these two different sets. The, the scope of the task uh, that you mentioned in your report with ATF, that there's a regulatory function and a criminal function overlap at times. And there were obvious issues that happened at this. Um, and then I'm, I'm allow you to make a comment on one of those, and I have one more issue as well. The size of the agency and what they were trying to accomplish. Uh, as I read through your report, I got to page 338, and there was a very interesting comment there that basically alluded to the fact that ATF and Phoenix was over their head. They had too few people, they were trying to take on this massive task, and it looked like they were trying to accomplish something big, but they didn't have the right people, were not coordinating, that this, that this particular group of ATF agents were in way over their head and should not have been engaged in that. Again, it begs back to the scope of the task. So I've, I've got one more issue I want to visit on, but I want to talk a little bit about the issue of this. Regulatory versus criminal responsibility and the task that's been given to ATF and the, the number of agents they have on it. Do you have recommendations on that based on your investigation? We do, and uh, I think all, each of the issues you identified, Congressman, are very important, and reforms that need to happen. The department has three, four large law enforcement agencies under it, the FBI, the DEA, the ATF, and the Marshal Service. They should have consistency con uh, among their rules and requirements, of course, taking into account their different missions. That needs to happen. The fact that ATF was not brought under the Attorney General guidelines for, for undercover operations eight years into their tenure in the department, I think, was significant from our standpoint. And so we have recommended, and our second recommendation is for the department to go back and review the other components. Look at who's got the best practices. You have an organization, you have multiple law enforcement agencies. There needs to be some effort to look at best practices and figure out who's got them. If it's ATF, the other components should use them. If it's the FBI, the other components should use those. So I agree with you completely. So we're talking about a downsizing of their tasks. Let's make their tasks more specific and clear and also have clear parameters to supervision as you do with the other, the, other departments. There shouldn't be four different rules if one is better than the other. Right. It should conform. And if, one, one are, if this is redundant, then Correct. let's make it clear from there. Right. there. There also seems to be, as I read through your report, a bunker mentality that as soon as Grassley's letter hits, there is a shutdown and a let, let's not allow Melson to go out and talk to them right away. Let's try to limit this and let's try to work through the process and no one's talking to you know, and, and try to limit it and, and dial that down. Uh, there was a, uh, it, when, when uh, Senator Grassley's letter mentions gun runner, it's like, okay, let that sit out there when we really know it's fast and furious so we don't start to get into the details. And the stunning one was not just the, the, the February letter of 2011, it's the May letter and it's the June 15th testimony here to this committee that it was apparent by that point that they either knew or should have known at that point in senior leadership that what they were writing to Congress and what they were testifying was not the whole truth. It was a, a limited form of that, that if you interpreted it the right way, it might actually stand up under light, but now in retrospect, wasn't clear. That, that, that's, a, uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a treatment to Congress and to those investigating that we're going to close in and, and surround ourselves with the wagons and we're not going to allow anyone in. Did you get that sense at all? Well, when we looked at that May 2nd letter again, we reached the conclusion, as you noted, that by that point there was enough information in the department that it knew or should have known that it could not stand by that February 4th and, letter. And they were not telling us. They were, they were writing in such a way to make it look like they were saying one thing when they were really saying something different. Well, from our standpoint, the letter does appear to be literally true, as the committee itself, I think, indicated in a report, 
but our concern was knowing the information they knew after four letters between February 4 and May 2nd where the department made no substantive comments that by that point the appropriate response either was to continue saying no substantive comments till the IG report comes out or to acknowledge the information I already found. Right, and when senior leadership, they do not inform the Attorney General when Brian Terry is murdered that there is a federal nexus to this as well in this ongoing investigation. Again, that seems to be we're just kind of surrounding it and we're trying to make sure we're closing the information down rather than letting the information get out. It seems to be from the very beginning this was a shutdown of information. There were many points in this case at all levels where information flow not only wasn't what it should have been, but it, in some instances, as we outlined in there, it was inaccurate, even when information was flowing. Thank you. I yield back. I think the gentleman, we, let's see, make sure I go correctly here. We now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Schwartz, thanks for being here. Uh, I think what we have difficult with, and I know as attorneys talk to each other, it makes sense to them, but people in the regular world can't begin to understand what the heck it is that we're talking about. In my world, you know, any answer but a yes is a no. So if it takes a long time to explain it, it's because you're, you're hitting in stuff that's a little sensitive. You've done this for a long time. I know you've only been on this for five months, 13 months before it. How long does it take to do an investigation? Is this one of, of such a magnitude that we couldn't come to a conclusion quicker than this? Um, I will tell you, I'm, my understanding is in prior investigations like the U.S. Attorney investigation, that was a two-year or so investigation by the IG's office. Given the volume of documents that we had, 100,000 plus documents, and the scope we wanted to undertake, which was to take it through the congressional responses, it took a lot of time to do that. I think, and, and very importantly for us, this report had to be thorough, it had to be fair, and it had to be accurate. And it just took, I can tell you from the five months I was there working nonstop on this, it was an extraordinary amount of documents. But we wanted to make sure, and this is the commitment I made, I, I wanted this report to lay out all the facts. Yeah, and I think Period. that, I don't speak for myself, but also for the committee, that the 18 months that we were waiting to find out and being stonewalled time after time after time and requesting information and not being able to get it and getting documents delivered in pickup trucks in the thousands with most of the pages redacted, this one just doesn't pass the smell test. There's something wrong here that we're not getting to. And, uh, you know, I, I listen to this now. Jason Weinstein, he's resigned. Lanny Brewer, Gary Grindler, uh, other officials at the department, not going to receive any d disciplinary act action. Is that a disappointment to you after looking through what you've looked through for the last five months and building on the 13 months before that? You know, the way the, um, the, way the operations are set up and the law is set up, by Congress, we investigate, we then hand over our findings to the department, and it is for the department head to make those. And so decisions. in this case, the department and head would be whom? The Attorney General. Okay. And then so. it is up to the public and the Congress to decide what they have. Well, not so much. Uh, you know, I, think, I think we can, because perception, I think, in many cases is reality. Uh, and I think when you sit back and you watch, is this unwound or did not unwind? And as the chairman continued to ask questions and was stonewalled, you begin to get a feeling that, you know what, while we keep saying this isn't political in nature, I've found very few things in this town that aren't political in nature. And especially, uh, we talked about an administration, you know, this is going to be the most clear and transparent administration we've ever had. But when you ask questions and you can't get the answers, when you have the Attorney General come here and he can't answer the questions, when you look at things that are going on, I think the American public deserves better than that. I mean, they have the right to know, and we certainly have the responsibility to find out for them. But at some point, the buck has to stop somewhere. Now, the Attorney General is appointed by the, the, the President of the United States. He comes in, he gets vetted. But all of these different agencies, when there's a turnover at administrations, there's a whole group of people to come in with them. In other words, if I'm, a, if I'm taking over a company, I also come in. I bring in all the managers I want in all the departments. Now, there may be some of those people still working in the same departments, but there is a way that we do things differently. And what the law may not have changed, but maybe the policy and the way we enforce it and the way we go about it changes according to the philosophy or the, the methods of that administration. And so I, I look at this, and James talked about it, and we've all talked about it. Why? Why so long? Why so hard to get information that should have been very basic? And when we ask questions, it really required a yes or a no. And again, 
A simple yes would have been fine, but the dragging out and dragging out. Is there any wonder why the American people have lost faith in the way we do things down here? So you've looked at this, and I, I got to tell you, I don't know. I watch it, and, and I look at all the things that have happened. And whether it's Melson or, or Weinstein or whatever, if I'm a whistleblower, you know what I'm thinking? I'll probably never do that again. Instead of these people being given a plaque and being brought forward to say thanks for what you did, they get thrown under a bus. And we said, well, you've got to understand that's part of the process. He says, what we've got to do is we've got to make sure that the people at the top get protected, but you people at the bottom are very vulnerable. I would really be, as a person would work in those departments, I would be very lax. Very, I'd be very aware as you go through it. You look through this whole thing. Anything you see in your place, you disappointed that it looked more political? Well, I, I have that concern precisely, uh, Congressman. There needs to be an assurance that people who want to come forward come forward and don't feel like they're going to be retaliated against, demoted, action taken against them, against them, whatever it is. This case is an example of the importance of people willing to step forward. Yeah. And I was very moved. I got to tell you, when I, my first, one of the first hearings here was Agent Terry's family was here and the people that worked with them were here. They came here with a complete disregard for their future, but a complete dedication to the fact that this should not have happened to Brian Terry and they needed to get to the bottom of it. It's just troubling to me that after 18 months, things that we could have known way back then and things that have been distorted and manipulated didn't need to be done. And it just to me is again an indication of if we really mean what we say and say what we mean, we got to do it. We just can't do words and think that that's the way to placate people. And with that, uh, Chairman, you'll I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, uh, you've called for in your report the uh, uh, the unsealing of portions of the wiretaps that you used in you used from in your report. I'd like to also ask you to take possession of letters exchanges in which uh, this committee has some difference of opinion, but uh, concludes that wiretap aff affidavits describe specific incidences, incidences that would suggest the prosecutor who was focused on the question investigating tactics at the ATF would have been recognized uh, that there was an intent uh, not to interdict weapons from straw buyers, and particularly ones in which uh, straw buyers who were known to already be doing it were allowed to continue doing it, including the weapons sales that ultimately led to Brian Terry's death. If I'd ask you to receive these letters, uh, they're also uh, arguably speaking about items under seal, but um, in hopes that you would expand your request for the Justice Department to unseal portions that may be also covered by those letters. I've been given the letters and I'll take a look at them. I thank the yeah. gentleman. And with that, we go to the ever patient uh, Mr. Wahlberg, who of course represents my alma mater. So uh, I may have recognized you last in the order, but certainly not least. I thank the, the chairman. Uh, also, uh, I represent a district in the great state of Michigan, which uh, is proud of a favorite son, or a homegrown son, Brian Terry. And uh, we, we take that as important. Uh, also appreciate very much, Mr. Horowitz, uh, your work, um, extensive work, uh, but valuable work. Um, Representative Langford touched on the Grassley, May 2nd Grassley letter, and I appreciated that, and your response to that, uh, saying you were very troubled with the department's response as well. Do, do you believe your office had complete and unfettered access to the documents that you r required uh, to ensure a, a thorough review? I, I do, uh, Congressman. We, we asked for everything we thought was responsive, and we ultimately got everything we asked for. So you believe everything was that was necessary you received? That was represented to us, including, as noted in the report, we asked for some personal emails, uh, given the fact that in at least one instance we were aware of a transfer to a personal email account. Well, I, uh, again, I would reiterate uh, that's all we were asking here on this committee as well, for those same type of documents so we could have done this review, and I think it would have ultimately brought about um, uh, substantiating a report to what, uh, what you were able to bring. As I understand it, uh, you personally reviewed the Fast and Furious wiretap ap applications. That's correct. Uh, former AT ATF Director Ken Melson said that after he read the wiretaps, he was sick to his stomach. Uh, did you have a similar reaction? 
Well, after I read them, I came to the conclusion that there was, in my view, more than enough red flags to identify serious questions about the tactics being used in the case. Um, in relation to that, your report recommends that, uh, and I quote, the department should require that high-level officials who are responsible for authorizing wiretap applications conduct reviews of the applications and affidavits that are sufficient to enable those officials to form a personal judgment that the applications meet the statutory, statutory, uh, statutory criteria. That was on page 431. Uh, has the department given you any feedback on this recommendation or indicated that it will implement it? Well, in their letter to us that's attached as Exhibit A, they've indicated they agree with all our recommendations. And one of the things we've asked for is a report back in 90 days on the status of the response to our recommendations. So they have indicated they are uh, supportive of the recommendation. That's important. And now we will follow up in 90 days. Do you know whether uh, Assistant Attorney General Lanny Brewer um, agrees with this recommendation? I, I don't know personally. The letter is from the department on behalf of the department as a whole. So we assume that uh, Attorney General Holder agrees with the recommendation? That's my understanding. I appreciate that. We will wait to see. And uh, thank you for your response. I uh, yield to... How would the gentleman... I, are you going to yield to Mr. Gowdy? I was going to do that, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, I'm not real smart, but I'm smart enough to let the chairman go if he if he had a question. I, no, I just didn't want to make sure I didn't get it yielded back. The gentleman's recognized. I, I, I thank the chairman. I thank the gentleman from Michigan. Uh, Mr. Inspector General, I hate to inject facts as predicates for questions that members of Congress ask, but um, the record uh, will reflect. I know you already know this. The Attorney General was never held in contempt of Congress because of his actions with Fast and Furious. He was held in contempt of Congress because he failed to turn over documents to committees of Congress, documents which he turned over to you, documents some of which he's now beginning to turn over to us, uh, 300 uh, pages we got yesterday. So uh, I, I, I hate to make the record clear, but he was never held in contempt of Congress because he sanctioned gun walking. He was held in contempt of Congress because he thwarted our attempts to find out what you found out. Uh, secondly, uh, you said the February 4th letter was reviewed by dozens of people, including people within the criminal uh, division at the Department of Justice. Do you know whether Lanny Brewer read the February 4th, 2011 letter before it was delivered to Senator Grassley? Um, we found no evidence that he had reviewed it. He told us he was did not recall reviewing it, and we found nothing in the emails indicating he had actually reviewed it or made a comment about the content of the letter. Did he give you any indication as to why he would forward a draft of that to his personal private email account? Um, I, I would want to go back to precisely answer that and look at the transcript. My general recollection is, for purposes of reading it, but he didn't recall whether he had read it after it had been sent out on February 4th. Now, you've been around the block a time or two, um, uh, white-collar cases. Uh, you twice have used the word recall. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the same as saying I didn't read it. That's saying I don't recall reading it. Um, there's a difference, is there not? But it, there is. Uh, again, I am stumped as to what reason you would forward a letter to your personal email account if you're not a historian, you're not an archivist, uh, you're not teaching grammar to the person writing or drafting the letter. What other explanation is there for forwarding it uh, other than to read it? Uh, then that would, you'd assume, be the reason to do it. Well, uh, my time's up. I have more questions, but I would yield back, and I thank the gentleman from Michigan for his time. Uh, Mr. Horwitz, just to make the record clear, you said that uh, he didn't comment, but isn't isn't the response good job a comment? And if so, did that come before, during, or after the letter went out? The, the comment you are referring to came, I believe, on February 2nd, while the letter was still in draft form. I think from our standpoint, it didn't indicate an understanding of the content. And if we didn't use the precise words in the report that we should have, um, I, you know, I understand that. But yeah, it was, yeah, well, I'm, I'm concerned only because the Attorney General's office and Lanny Brewer as part of it 
lied to Congress, and he said good job with a draft that had the lie in it, and yet he's able to say, I don't remember reading it. Now, you're a former prosecutor, maybe one again someday. Do you accept that you're able to respond, good job, able to do as Mr. Gowdy said, forward it to your personal email, able to allow 10 months to go by as an attorney and an officer of the court by definition, you're able to do all of that and yet say, well, yeah, I would have known it was a lie if I read it, but I didn't read it. Would yeah. you accept that as a prosecutor or would you go forward and let, at least let the jury decide? Well, I think in, in doing this review, our standard was whether we could draw a decision, a judgment based on the evidence we had to put it in this report ultimately. And what we decided was we needed to put out the facts of what was we found, others can draw conclusions. We didn't feel like we could draw that conclusion in this report. And but I you, did, you did reach it. what I might do as a prosecutor. Right. But you did reach a conclusion that he knew or should have known. I mean, he was in that lump group that was at least somewhat derelict in a letter going out that he received, he forwarded, he commented on, and then says he doesn't remember reading, and in fact was a lie to Congress and for 10 months was all over the front page of newspapers as we insisted that we'd been lied to, that there was gun walking, and that our whistleblowers were telling the truth. Well, they were re being retaliated against by the Attorney General's representatives. Well, what we found as to Mr. Brewer was, frankly, regardless of whether he read the letter or not, given what he knew about wide receiver, his responsibility should have been to come forward and explain what happened in wide receiver because the people who were drafting the letter told us it would have made a difference. And that's what troubled us. Thank you. And at this time, it doesn't matter whether he read the letter, Frank. Thank you. At it. this time, to make the record complete, I ask unanimous consent that the email trains of, two th of uh, 2011 uh, House, H -O <laughs> House Oversight and Government Reform DOJ bait stamp number 004022 be placed in the record. These items concerning regarding ATF gunrunner are between uh, Dennis Burke and a number of people, Ron Welsh, Weish, and so on, but including Lanny Brewer. Uh, also, Bates Stamp, DOJ, Ho H House Oversight and Government Reform, DOJ, 004449, dated 2 2 2011, uh, in which uh, in which Lanny Brewer place, uh, placed into his personal email, uh, the address being redacted, uh, forward, revised Grassley letter, Grassley ATF clean 5 p.m. docs, in which uh, there, there are a number of comments we've already alluded to. Without objection, so ordered. And with that, we now recognize as our final question in the first round, the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Adams. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the committee for allowing me to sit in and uh, join the committee. Mr. Horwitz, I've sat here, and, I, and as you know, I come from a law enforcement background, so I sit here and I listen, and I am very concerned that we had an operation that appeared to have no true oversight from anyone in an upper level, and when an exit strategy is requested in March of 2010 um, and nothing happens, I have a few questions as to what happened to this agency. And I think I need to go back to maybe even before, because as I worked with this agency years ago in law enforcement, they had these oversight protections. You could not get a wiretap without going and getting someone from above to review it and approve it and then have it taken to a judge to be signed. So. Um, do you happen to know when they decided to do away with that practice? Um, I can provide you with the answer. I don't recall as I sit here, but there was an evolving practice, as you indicated, at ATF that removed that requirement. That would be nice to know as to when they decided to remove those practices because apparently um, those supervisors that should have been reviewing it did not review it or claimed to have not reviewed it, and therefore... Uh, we have a loss of a life of one of our own Border Patrol agents and many weapons across the border and people being harmed every day. I, too, wanted to ask you, because I was reading on page 265 a statement about Mr. Hoover's 
Uh, he said he told us he did not recall attending the briefing on March 5th or the briefing from Melson on March 11th, although his outlook calendar indicates that he was invited to the meetings and, as mentioned earlier, other witnesses placed him at both those briefings. And, uh, you know, I've heard many of your comments about, well, people could not recall. People could not recall. As an attorney, someone who has prosecuted cases, when someone tells you they can't recall, what is your first impression as an attorney? Well, it probably depends on the context, but when you In have, the context of something like this, have, what would your... Right. When you have uh, Outlook invites and other people recalling you're there, it probably means you were there. It means you were there. And so in the case of Mr. Brewer, when he had this email that was forwarded from himself to himself on a private account and he sends back good job as an attorney step aside from and if this had been a case that you were investigating as an attorney and prosecuting what would your impression be um, do you believe he would have sent it to, the, to read it the only thing that causes me hesitation there is that at this when you go through the email string you do have Mr. Weinstein, when he sends the draft at the bottom of that string, it, Brewer, Mr. Brewer isn't one of the people to whom he sends. And there can be a tendency at times, I'm not drawing a judgment in this case, but there can be a, a, a tendency at times when someone sends you a, an email or reporting on your good work to say back, good job, or something like that. So I, one of the things I wanted to be careful of in this case is to make sure everything was well founded in our view that we had something to support it but to put out the evidence and let people draw their own views and conclusions about that and so i respect uh, the varying views that i've heard today about that issue i appreciate that and uh, your friendship with uh, mr brewer would, brewer would not impact your decision making on any of this would it not it had zero impact when i took the oath to take this office i took an oath to do this job and as I committed before the Senate Judiciary Committee, the only thing that was going to make my decisions here were the facts and the law, period. And I appreciate the fact that you were asking for personal emails because I, I did ask that question in committee. And I know that my colleague uh, would like to ask another question. So if I may, I will yield the rest of my time to Mr. Gowdy. I thank the gentlelady from uh, Florida. Uh, Mr. Horowitz, I want to... Um, ask you this. I've only got about 30 seconds, so I'll, I'll do the quickest one uh, that I have. Is your investigation still ongoing? There are pieces of this investigation that are ongoing, as we've reflected in the report. All right, and I will not ask you anything more beyond uh, that. Um, contrary to the assertions of my colleagues, uh, many of us have never asserted that the Attorney General knew about the tactic of gun walking. We have asserted that he should have, and what kind of uh, leadership or management style you have does uh, reflect on what kind of information is brought to you. Did you make specific recommendations with respect to creating a culture within the Department of Justice where information like this would wake, work its way up the command chain? Well, one of the things that I hope to do through the whistleblower ombudsman position is to make sure that there's an understanding and appreciation and a willingness for people to come forward and to get that information forward. That is one of the tasks I want to undertake is to look at that culture issue because I do, I agree with you. I think it's important. I thank the gentlelady. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we'll now take a short uh, second round. We won't keep you much longer. Um, one of the areas of particular interest, uh, Mr. Horwitz, uh, you received 100,000 documents. We got about 7,000 many of them documents we didn't ask for, but one particular one that appeared in your report discussed emails between Jason Weinstein, the head of the Office of Enforcement or Oper Operations, and William uh, McMahon, uh, who we, has been unavailable to us, in May of 2010 regarding applications and a possible roving wiretap. It's on page 271 of your report. You're familiar with it? I am. These documents were explicitly asked for in our subpoenas, but the department never failed to hand them over. Do you think it is, an, it is appropriate for the department to deliberately withhold these documents without citing any reason or privilege uh, for doing so? And I might note claiming that they had turned over uh, extensive, unprecedented documents before February 4th. Would this document be unprecedented to send, set over 
uh, in your opinion? Well, um, let me just say they were clearly to us highly relevant. Uh, I frankly don't know the back and forth that occurred or the, or the decision making that occurred within the department, so I don't think I'm in a position to answer precisely that question without understanding. Well, the I, but I'll rephrase. This document was, was relevant and important to your investigation. It occurred before February 4th. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So when the Attorney General has repeatedly said that he made unprecedented levels of documents available to us, he was thorough and complete, and he came before Congress so many times before February 4th, and then omitted this, he omitted something which was clearly relevant and important to the investigation. As I said, I think these documents were, to us, highly relevant and important, which is why we spent so much time discussing them. Now, as a former prosecutor, if you deliver a subpoena and somebody simply doesn't mention a document, doesn't turn it over and it's relevant to the subpoena, but yet they assert that they have fully complied with the subpoena, isn't that a, 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 actually a violation of the law to simply not turn something over that you know you have? Well, without understanding all the facts, I... Well, I'm just talking about the hypothetical as a generally. prosecutor. As a prosecutor, but you serve a subpoena, clearly. you either get it or the counsel, the lawyers for the other side, have an obligation to assert a privilege provide a log, do all these things, you don't simply not deliver it. That would certainly be the expectation. Are you considering or pursuing or investigating criminal referrals related to whistleblower retaliation? And I, I'm making all of those so that you not have to answer any one of them. Uh, let me say we are actively investigating a variety of the whistleblower issues, some of which the committee has referred to us and Senator Grassley has referred to us. I'd be hesitant to say what we're going to do, but I think you'll find the reports will be coming in the not-too-distant future, and we are taking them very seriously. Thank you. Now, I'm going to go against uh, sometimes the advice of folks who say, well, you know, don't link the constant uh, allegations that wide receiver and fast and furious are two peas in a pod. I'm going to ask you a question I think that is at, at the kernel of, of my concern. You, you discovered in, in your report extensively that a number of people, including people at justice at the highest levels, were aware of wide receiver. They knew it had failed. They knew it had been shut down. They had U.S. attorney records. And yet they allowed Fast and Furious, whether through commission or omission, to do the same and more. Correct? Uh, they, there was no action apparent to try and change any policies I agree with you. Okay. So Justice Department knew that guns were walking, by their definition, at least in retrospect, and they didn't take steps to stop it. We have a lot of people dead on both sides of the border. Aren't you very concerned that these are the very elements that it takes for the federal government, for our government, for Congress's appropriated dollars to be paid out in damages, whether to the hundreds of people dead in Mexico or at least one U.S. Border Patrol agent dead in the U.S. Isn't this kind of failure one that exposes the federal government to huge potential damages? Uh, I'm sure that's the case, and it troubled us very much that so many people understood and knew what happened in wide receiver, took no actions, and frankly, in fast and furious again, so many people knew about it as the investigation was going on put aside what happened after the agents came forward, um, just as it was going on that so many people knew and no one seemed to take action, even the deputy director again when he noticed the need for an exit strategy. Now you, uh, you interviewed Lanny Brewer, correct? Or some, one of your people interviewed him. Uh, after Brian Terry was killed, after the February 4th letter, Lanny Brewer looked me dead in the eye and told me, uh, that, in fact, there was nothing wrong with Fast and Furious. It was bad work on the ground. When you interviewed him, was that still his feeling that, that there was nothing wrong with Fast and Furious, but simply the ATF agents had bungled it? Um, I don't recall his precise answers to those questions. I'm happy to go back and get that uh, for the record okay. for you. Uh, I'm going to you know, yield to the ranking member. Uh, this is, continues to be my reason that I have so much doubt about Lanny Brewer's judgment and his ability to continue doing his job is that he believed that after February 4th, 
he believed it after Brian Terry was dead, and I can't understand for the life of me how he could have believed it and still have his job. With that, I recognize the ranking member. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. The, um, Mr. Horowitz, um, I have a kernel of concern myself. The, um, you know, after you've been around here uh, a few years like I have, um, you get concerned about uh, effectiveness and efficiency. I started my discussion off by thanking you and your staff for all that you've done. But the question is, is where does this lead? All those hours, all that effort. Uh, my mother, a former sharecropper, used to teach us limited ed education, second grade education. She, 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 would, she would tell us, you can't have motion, commotion, and emotion and no results. Motion, commotion, emotion, no results. There are moments in life and even in legislative life where things come together and it presents a moment which is pregnant with the possibility of change. And if it does not, if change does not take place at that moment, things usually get worse. This is one of those moments. I give the uh, chairman credit. He's brought all of this to light. We've got a, a, a great picture. You all have painted the picture quite accurately for us. I don't think anybody up here likes the picture that we see. To be frank with you, knowing Eric Holder the way I know him, the honorable man he is, I don't think he likes this picture. And so for all of us, you know, reform is so very, very, very important. And in that light, because I want to be effective and efficient. I don't want to leave here looking back at my tenure in Congress and say I had, I was involved in one of those moments where we did nothing and it just got worse, where we did nothing and folks continued to be killed in Mexico with guns flowing from the United States, where we did nothing, where neighborhoods like the one I live in, where it's easier to get a gun than it is to get a cigarette where we did nothing. And so as to the reforms, I want to ask you just a few questions. The Department of Justice has made significant changes in ATF and DOJ policy to ensure that the mistakes made in Operation Wide Receive and Operation Fast and Furious never happen again. While new permanent leadership within ATF is an important step to ensuring accountability, Acting Director Todd Jones has also implemented several policy changes at ATF to improve case supervision and communication between field agents and ATF management. In November 2011, Acting Director Jones issued a memo clarifying ATF's policy regarding firearms transfers, reinforcing the importance of interdiction and directing agents to take all reasonable steps to prevent a firearms criminal misuse. Mr. Horowitz, your report describes this memo as explicitly stating that, and I quote, if law enforcement officials have any knowledge that guns are about to cross the border, they must take immediate action to prevent that from occurring, even, even if it means jeopardizing an investigation. I ask you now, what do you think of this guidance? Is it sufficient, or would additional guidance be helpful? I think it's an important piece of guidance, but I think more has to be done, and I couldn't agree with you more congressman about the opportunity to affect change in light of these events. We put out reports not just to put out reports, but to see change happen when it needs to happen. And I didn't come back to t take this job to write a report and have nobody follow through and no one listen to, it, to what we say and what we recommend, which is why our recommendations are bigger than just this case. For example, recommending to the department that it create a regular interagency law enforcement coordination effort among its own law enforcement agencies because I think as you see here there was a failure to coordinate among agencies sharp elbows a variety of things happened and I'm guessing from what I understand and we'll see when the inspector general's report comes out from DHS that you will see more of that from the ICE standpoint and there ha that has to go away and that's an issue we've got to think about well, I just want, I, again, I, I want to thank you all for uh, your efforts. 
And I know that, um, and I, I, can, I can assure you that all of us up here want to make sure that your efforts have not been in vain. And um, I'm hoping, I don't know, just how much jurisdiction do you have with regard to trying to make sure that the recommendations actually happen? I know we have some, some pressure points up here, but I mean, how about you? You, you talked all about things that you're going to follow up on. Uh, how do you see that playing out? Um, what we do, and as we've outlined here, is we've asked the department and the attorney general to report back to us within 90 days on the status of the efforts and with a timeline for implementing it, because as we all know, if there's not a timeline in place, things drag. So our goal is to follow up, make sure things happen, because as an IG, uh, our strength is in a report like this and then following up on it. And uh, if recommendations aren't followed, to go and report back, whether it's to Congress or the Attorney General or to others, that they haven't been followed through. Mr. Chairman, I don't know what will happen in the election, but I hope that both sides will agree to bring back the appropriate parties in, you know, in, in, in say, four months. He said nine, uh, 90, 90 days, but maybe in four months so that we can actually have that accountability that we're talking about, so that we can have that, hope, that effectiveness and efficiency. I agree with the gentleman. Uh, I would hope that Mr. Horowitz would keep his calendar open in mid to late January. Uh, I forgot to do something at the open before I recognize Mr. Gowdy. Uh, as is the custom, I ask unanimous consent that all members have seven days to insert written statements and extraneous matter into the record. Without objection, so ordered. And Mr. Gowdy, uh, other than closing, you get the last word. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to have just a little potpourri here at the end. I'm going to bounce around, um, and it's not designed to, uh, to fool you, although I don't think I could if that were my design. Uh, do you know when the Mexican government was informed about Fast and Furious or if they have been debriefed on it? Because I could imagine it would impact our relationship with law enforcement in Mexico. Um, I, I don't know when they were debriefed, and I don't know the extent to which they were debriefed about it. Um, there, there were some indications in mail and emails that we saw about the possibility of alerting the Mexican authorities, but I, I don't know. All right. Uh, there has been some discussion this morning about changes. Uh, Mr. Cummings, as he always is, was extremely eloquent talking about the, the, the desire to not see this moment pass. I also don't want to see this moment used for uh, purposes uh, that are uh, duplicative. Uh, did you ever prosecute 924C cases? Yes, although infrequently. Uh, non the, the penalty for 924C, which is using a firearm during a drug trafficking crime or another violent crime, is five years consecutive to any other sentence. And each subsequent 924C is a consecutive five years. And depending on the nature of the weapon, if it's semi-automatic, it could be up to 20 years, and the third offense would be life. Um, I, uh, by virtue of the fact I went to law school, I'm not good at math, but five years times a 1,000 weapons just strikes me that unless your name is Methuselah, that's going to be a really long sentence. And I would also be curious, and I may ask you some point to look into whether or not uh, line AUSAs are asking for upward departures in lying and buying cases. Uh, the remedy is not always to raise the statutory maximum if we're never coming close to the statutory maximum in the first place. Thirdly, uh, I want to I want to say this because I want to conclude on a more harmonious note. Uh, your job is to identify. Uh, facts and you do draw some conclusions and um, almost all of your conclusions I um, agree with and I'm not suggesting we disagree on this I, I have a little different analysis uh, with respect to the criminal division chief um, I, I think uh, it is uh, without question that he knew the tactic of gun walking existed within the department whether he wants to say wide receiver or fast or furious is irrelevant to me he knew the February 4th letter was false as drafted. Uh, uh, I appreciate uh, the fact that there could be explanations other than reading a letter uh, that you would forward a letter to your private personal email account. And I appreciate the fact that from time to time we don't read emails in full. We just say good job or thanks for sending it. I just have a higher expectation for that department and for the criminal chief. I think it's wonderful that we have someone of your independence. I actually thought that's what prosecutors and ministers of justice were to begin with. So I'm going to conclude by saying the same thing I said when I started. Uh, you have an incredibly hard, important job. You were in 
exceedingly candid in our personal conversations, and you have been exceedingly professional in your public testimonies. And I wish you and the people that work with you all the best, because on this we can agree, the Department of Justice is not just another political entity. And when we lose confidence in that blindfolded woman holding a set of scales and a sword, we're finished. It's not about politics. It never was. I appreciate the fact that Mr. Cummings would compliment Mr. Issa. This is a very politically charged environment that we work in and that you work in. And the fact that your work could draw bipartisan support um, is a testament to you and your staff. So with that, I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman uh, yield for just a moment? Yes, sir. Thank you. I never thought we'd actually get through your questions. You were good. Uh, I want to I want to summarize a couple of things. Uh, obstructing Congress is a crime. I'll make the statement. You don't you don't have to evaluate that one. Uh, clearly, justice during this time obstructed Congress. They uh, they made an untruthful statement on February fourth. They doubled down by having it, at a minimum a, an extremely deceiving statement. Uh, as I've often said, the only way it's truthful they didn't let guns walk is that the guns didn't physically have legs and feet and shoes. Uh, they, uh, in multiple areas, did not respond honestly and truthfully to a subpoena, leaving information out, information they've made available to you. And of course, the, the separate contempt question of, of refusing afterwards. But in that case, I'll accept that they were going to argue uh, the, uh, the question of uh, presidential executive privilege. What do you think we should do and what can you do when agencies outright refuse to provide information pursuant to an investigation of a crime? You know, what I did when I walked into this job and was committed to doing was pressing forward and writing a report that covered everything and putting it forward and letting if folks thought there was material to redact, that was their responsibility. My job was to get to the facts and put it out there so the Congress, the American public could see what we saw, understand what we saw, hear the facts that we found, and the conclusions that we reached. That's my job as Inspector General. I wanted that out there, and I'm glad it's out there. And now, obviously, as to what occurred or didn't occur in terms of productions and other instances, the evidence is there as to what we saw and we found. But will you be looking into or doing any potential criminal referrals, which is within your, your authority, uh, related to the February 4th letter and those who either lied or who became aware, particularly lawyers, officers of the court, became aware that an untruthful statement had been made and sought sought to make no effort to correct the record. And, and let me just touch on that on the February 4th letter, because that is important. Um, we looked at that and tried to figure out what people's intent was in state of mind, because so much of that is driven by intent. And the difficulty with that letter, as we outline in the report, is it was such a disorganized and problematic process that you had people who didn't know information making substantive edits to a letter along with people who did know information providing inaccurate information and sorting out how that letter ended up the way it did and blaming one person or two people for the particular information they came forward was the difficulty we had. It was such a um, you know, problematic process as we try and lay out uh, that you couldn't disentangle all, from our standpoint all the different pieces as to who offered what and how changes were made. That was the difficulty we had with the intent issue. Thank you. Mr. Cummings, do you have any closing remarks? Yeah, I just have one. Uh, I was just listening to the question that the uh, chairman uh, asked. Um, on page 395 of the report, the, the uh, Inspector General's report did not find that senior Justice Department officials engaged in an intentional effort to mislead Congress. Instead, the Inspector General found, and I quote, department officials relied on information provided by senior uh, component officials that was not accurate. Is that, is that, I'm reading that from your report. That's correct. And, and, the and that goes to what you were just saying? Right. 
I see. And the problem is they were getting information in some instances was inaccurate, in some instances was accurate, and then the people finally drafting the letter who didn't know the underlying factual scenario were actually making changes that they didn't realize were substantive to the letter. Thank you very much, Jim. I thank the gentleman. In closing, this, is, this concludes a major chapter in Fast and Furious and the false statements made to Congress, particularly to Senator Grassley afterwards. As we turn the page, it is this committee's hope that we will in the coming days see a level of cooperation that we have not thus seen. I was encouraged that the 300 or so pages that uh, the Attorney General personally said he would give me if I dropped further action on the subpoena were delivered without that subpoena being dropped. Notwithstanding that, I hope in the days to come that most, if not all, of those 100,000 pages that were made available to you, Mr. Horowitz, would be made available to this committee, or in the alternative and perhaps better, an ability, a, a willingness by the Attorney General to allow a side-by-side -side evaluation by our committee so that we could save the redundant time that you, you and your staff have used uh, a great deal of uh, in gleaning the facts and figures of these documents that we haven't seen. It would be hopeful that that kind of willingness to have our investigators see what you've seen uh, would, in fact, allow this to come to a quicker close and perhaps eliminate the need for a protracted fight in the courts. Lastly, uh, I look forward to the American people having an opportunity to read as much of the material as can be made unsealed as possible. I believe the American people and the Terry family have an absolute right to have as much transparency as possible. I think particularly when we look at the failure of the safeguards of uh, the Fourth Amendment rights, as you so aptly said, that in fact all groups, groups who have nothing to do with Fast and Furious but have everything to do with civil liberties, are going to want to know how these failures occurred in detail and, like the ranking member said, in a nonpartisan this does not happen again. I might note that ATF is not the only uh, law enforcement agency that requests wiretaps. Wiretaps are requested on a daily basis from many organizations. Through this investigation, I have, as a non-lawyer, gleaned a better understanding that wiretaps are presented to judges at, normally as a nearly complete decision. Judges rely on the honesty and integrity of the process at the Justice Department in order to authorize these. That does not mean they don't have the right to question or to reject, but for the most part, they are quickly dispensed with based on a trust that the documents are complete. Often judges have told me that, in fact, their clerks look through a number of this and they rely on the completeness of that. To me, that says that the American people's constitutional protections are perhaps delegated to individuals who ultimately do not exist in the statute as the responsible parties. I think Mr. Horowitz's statement of his own experience at a time when he was reading these wiretap requests tell us that this has not always been so much a beneath me even though the statute requires me standard. For that reason, both uh, for those of us on both committees, Judiciary and Oversight, I pledge to work with both those committees to see that there is strict adherence to the statute in the future. And we do so not because of the Terry family suffering, but in fact because the American people have a right to expect that government respects greatly the limited and necessary invasion into people's privacy and that it must be both necessary and limited. In the case of Fast and Furious, it was not necessary. And if nothing else has been so told, the understanding that these operations continued long after a wiretap was not the source of additional information was a lesson. Lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Mr. Horowitz and your entire team who have worked tirelessly for perhaps more months than some people would like, including those of you who worked on it for so many months. But I think for the Terry family, who is trying to deal with the striking down of their son, their brother, their cousin, 
at the tender age of 40, for those over here, very tender age of 40, in a way that he shouldn't have been. This will bring partial closure. And for that, I'd like to thank you, and I know the Terry family would like to. And with that, I thank Mr. Cummings for his efforts today. I thank all the uh, uh, members who participated. And uh, Mr. Horwitz, again, for those not sitting behind you and the many who have worked so long, please express our thanks for your thorough and complete work. And with that, we stand, uh, we stand adjourned on this, and we will immediately reconvene uh, after you leave for a quick markup. You can read the Justice Department Inspector General's report on the Fast and Furious gun operation. ...letter in which, admittedly now, the Justice Department falsely stated that in Operation Fast and Furious, guns did not walk. As I have often said since that time, the only way that statement could be true is if you believed for guns to walk, they had to have legs. Operation Fast and Furious is a poster child for what you don't do with deadly weapons. You don't lose track of them. You don't allow more and more and more of them to go. Well, in fact, you're already seeing the effects of those weapons killing people in Mexico. And let us make no mistake, weapons had already been found at deadly scenes of uh, crimes in Mexico before Fast and Furious shut down. Only the tragic loss of Brian A. Terry brought an end to Fast and Furious. Although this report will not bring a complete end to the need for us to work with justice to bring genuine reform to their process, it goes a long way toward that. I, was, I will particularly note that I'm pleased that in some cases the executive privilege invalidly claimed by the President of the United States was not asserted in this discovery. Some materials contained in this report do help us because they are, in fact, many of the items that we wish we had received. In some cases, we're told we, we received, but in fact, we later found were provided to the IG and not to us. The conclusions in any report by an IG are, in fact, respectful and less than conclusions as to what management must do. But already since yesterday, two top individuals whose time to resign had come 14, 16, 18, 19 months ago resigned. We expect that all 14 would find a way to find appropriate new occupations, ones in which their poor judgment or lack of dedication or unwillingness to actually 
read documents they were required to read would, be held, would not be held accountable. There is no place in our government for people who under statute are required to do something and then say, I didn't do it, but I didn't need to do it because somebody else did it below me. That's exactly why, why Congress puts in, in place a number of safeguards at what level things such as wiretaps uh, can be authorized. For the American people who know that ultimately a wiretap application is trusted by a judge in most cases who grants it, the only protection for the American people is in fact knowing that there are safeguards in the application that an agent or an individual simply can't tap your phone by running up an application. The very safeguards that failed in Fast and Furious to know what was already known and that wiretaps would tell you in no uncertain terms that guns were walking, that same lack of, of safeguards could also cause anyone to see their phone tapped when in fact it should not be under the law. So I look at the protections not granted to safeguard against a fatally flawed uh, tactic like Fast and Furious, but I look at it to know, as the uh, IG noted in his report, that there need to be material changes and controls in how wiretap applications go through a process for approval. Now, over the next several hours, we will hear an awful lot from our witness and I rely on our questions to be germane to our witnesses' 471-page report. I believe that, in fact, given an opportunity to have fair question and answer, we will understand, first of all, why Jason Weinstein resigned yesterday, why Kenneth Melson retired yesterday, and why there is much work to be done to reform the Department of Justice and the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agency in order for the American people, and I might note the people of Mexico, to have confidence in this government. Lastly, nothing in this report vindicates anyone. If you touched, looked, could have touched, could have looked, could have asked for information that could have caused you to intervene, to complain, to worry, to talk to people and you didn't, and you are in our government, or even if you aren't in our government but were aware of it, you fell short of your responsibility. We all have a responsibility to protect against firearms ending up in the hands of dangerous criminals. With that, I want to thank again our IG for being here today, and I yield to Mr. Cummings. Department's post-February 4th actions in responding to Congress. Additionally, at our request, the Department has agreed to seek court authorization to unredact as much of the wiretap information that we included in this report as possible. If the court agrees to the Department's request, we will shortly issue a revised version of the report with that material unredacted. The investigation that became known as Operation Fast and Furious began on October 31, 2009. By the time the indictment was announced on January 25, 2011, over a year later, ATF agents had identified more than 40 people connected to a trafficking conspiracy that was responsible for purchasing over 2,000 firearms for approximately $1.5 million in cash. Yet ATF agents seized only about 100 of those firearms that had been purchased. Numerous firearms that had been bought by straw purchasers were recovered by law enforcement officials at crime scenes in Mexico and in the United States. One such recovery occurred on December 14, 2010, in connection with the tragic shooting death of a federal law enforcement agent, U.S. Customs and Border Protection agent Brian Terry. Shortly thereafter, the flaws in Operation Fast and Furious became known, a result, as a result, of the willingness of a few ATF agents to come forward and tell what they knew about it, and as a result of the conduct of the investigation by the Congress. On February 28th, the Attorney General requested my office 
to conduct a review of Operation Fast and Furious, and we agreed to do so. During the course of our review, we received information about other ATF firearm trafficking investigations that raised serious questions about how they were conducted. Our report reviews one of them, Operation Wide Receiver. We concluded that both Operation Wide Receiver and Operation Fast and Furious were seriously flawed and supervised irresponsibly by ATF's Phoenix Field Division, by the U.S. Attorney's Office, and by ATF Headquarters, most significantly in their failure to adequately consider the risk to the public safety in the United States and Mexico. Both investigations sought to identify the higher reaches of firearms trafficking networks by deferring any overt law enforcement action against the individual straw purchasers, such as making arrests or seizing firearms, even when there was sufficient evidence to do so. The risk to the public's safety was immediately evident in both investigations. Almost from the outset of each case, ATF agents learned that the purchases were being financed by violent Mexican drug trafficking organizations and that firearms were destined for Mexico. Yet, in Operation Fast and Furious, we found that no one responsible for the case, either at the Phoenix Field Division or at ATF's headquarters or in the U.S. Attorney's Office, raised a serious question or concern about the government not taking earlier measures to disrupt a firearm trafficking operation that continued to purchase firearms with impunity for many months. We also did not find any persuasive evidence that supervisors in Phoenix, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, or at ATF headquarters raised serious questions or concerns about the risks to the public safety posed by the continuing firearm purchases or by the delay in arresting individuals who were engaged in the trafficking activity. This failure, we found, reflected a significant lack of oversight and urgency by both ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office, and a disregard by both for the safety of individuals in the United States and in Mexico. Our review revealed a series of misguided strategies, tactics, errors in judgments, and management failures that permeated ATF headquarters and the Phoenix Field Division, as well as the U.S. Attorney's Office and the headquarters of the Department of Justice. In the course of our review, we identified individuals ranging from line agents and prosecutors in Arizona to senior ATF officials in Washington, D.C., who bore a share of responsibility for ATF's knowing failures in both of these operations to interdict firearms illegally destined for Mexico and for pursuing this risky strategy without adequately taking into account the significant danger to public safety that it created. We also found failures by department officials related to these matters, including failing to respond accurately to a congressional inquiry about them. Based on our findings, we made six recommendations designed to increase the continue to uh, work their way through the continuing resolution, temporary federal spending through fiscal year uh, 2013. The committee will come to order. Would you please close the doors? The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. It's our job to work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is our mission. Today, we are dealing with exactly that kind of a situation. The IG's report issued yesterday began with watchdogs and whistleblowers making us aware of a fatally flawed operation known as Fast and Furious. Before I begin in, uh, with my opening statement in earnest, I want to first take time to thank Mr. Horowitz. 
On behalf of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, I want to congratulate him on, in fact, delivering an extremely comprehensive, strong, and independent report. Mr. Horowitz is not new to the department, but he's new to this job. And as Inspector General, a Senate-confirmed nomination of March 29th, <clears throat> and when you were sworn in on August 16th, we all asked the question, can you pick up and do this kind of a job on such a monumental task that had already languished for a period of time before your entrance? Yesterday, you proved to both sides of the aisle that you could, and I want to personally thank you. I note that, in fact, IGs serve a purpose that, in fact, we do not get and have not gotten from any administration, if not for the 74 IGs and the 12,000 men and women that work for them. The level of transparency, accountability over waste, fraud, abuse of power, abuse of discretion, and the like would not be possible. This committee, more than any other in the con Congress, relies on their work. And yesterday, we were not disappointed. The 471-page report released yesterday is a huge step forward toward restoring the public faith in the Department of Justice. I was impressed with the professionalism and thoroughness and scope of the report. I know, having been only the day before with Brian Terry's family in Arizona, where we dedicated the Border Patrol station he worked out of before his untimely murder in 2010, that they too undoubtedly were impressed that a great deal of the closure they wanted by responsible parties at all levels was met yesterday. The conclusions after 19 months of hard work, of course, are greater than some would want and fall short of what others would want. They cannot, by definition, bring complete closure because even the IG in his report still has some questions. There were some individuals and some documents that are not yet available but like any document, you have to at some point cut it off, come as you are, and bring what you have. I think this was the appropriate time. I'm particularly pleased that we waited an additional week to allow for materials that otherwise might not have been in the report. This committee has had a difficult relationship with justice, much of it because the Attorney General, no matter how many times we asked, no matter how many, how many times we subpoenaed, no, how many no matter how many meetings our staff had, were unable to get the level of cooperation necessary even to the information that the IG received. I hope in the next Congress, whoever sits in my chair will face an administration that understands that openness to Congress openness to the Freedom of Information Act, and particularly openness to the Inspector General's offices is critical if the American people are to have confidence in their government. Much of what is in the report, but not the main subject of the report, has to do with the February 4, 2011 for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for calling this hearing. And let me welcome our witness, Mr. Horowitz, um, and to thank you and your staff, everybody from the uh, clerk to you. Uh, I want to make it very, very clear I join the chairman in expressing our appreciation. It is a thorough report. Your staff has done an outstanding job. I know that they've missed a lot of vacation days and missed time with their families, but I want them to understand that we truly, truly appreciate not only their work, but the excellent way in which they did it. And I hope they're listening, and uh, thank you again. Um, your office has worked for more than a year and a half on this investigation. They reviewed more than 100,000 pages of documents and interviewed 130 witnesses in compiling this very comprehensive report. They did it 
under the microscope of a highly politicized environment in which public accusations were sometimes made before the search for evidence even began. It was a difficult task, but he and you and your office did an admirable job, and, and again, we thank you. In my opinion, one of the most important things we can do here today is recognize the service of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry, who gave his life for his country. Although it cannot be truly, truly not, not, although it cannot truly offer any solace to his family, I hope this report provides at least some of the answers they have been searching for since Agent Terry's murder. Let me next commend Chairman Issa. We've had many disagreements about how this investigation should proceed, but the fact is, is that the committee uncovered a severe problem that was festering since 2006 in the Phoenix office of ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona that allowed criminals in Mexico and the United States to obtain hundreds of guns. This committee played an important role in exposing and halting these flawed operations. I also want to commend the Attorney General. I have lost count of how many times he has testified on this issue, but he has remained even-handed, respectful, and always true to the daunting and critical mission of the department he leads. He requested this IG investigation, and he has already put numerous reforms in place. To that end, I note that the administration did not assert executive privilege over any part of the Inspector General's report, over any of the documents relied on by the Inspector General. In fact, the Department went a step further. Yesterday, it sent to this committee more than 300 pages of additional documents that were withheld previously. I think this is a positive development. I've always believed, and I continue to believe, that the committee and the Department can resolve any lingering issues without further conflict. With this action by the Department, I urge the committee to reconsider its position and settle the remnants of this dispute without resorting to unnecessary and costly litigation that nobody in this country wants. With that, let me turn to the report in order to highlight several key points and raise some very specific questions. There can no longer be any doubt that gun walking began under the Bush administration. The IG report goes into great detail about Operation Wide Receiver, and it finds that ATF agents simply let guns walk. It also finds that wiretap affidavits in Operation Wide Receiver contain just as much detail as those in Fast and Furious. The IG report concludes, and I quote, these tactics were used by ATF more than three years before Operation Fast and furious was initiated, end of quote. There can also no longer be any doubt that gun walking was never authorized or approved by the Attorney General or senior department officials, especially as some sort of top-down scheme or conspiracy against the Second Amendment. The IG report found that gun walking, and I quote, was primarily the result of tactical and strategic decisions by agents and prosecutors, end of quote. As the IG says in his written testimony for today's hearing, ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona, quote, share equal responsibility for the strategic and operational failures in operations wide receiver and fast and furious, end of quote. With these points in mind, I have two broad questions, Mr. Horowitz, which I hope you will address. First, how could this tactic have been used for so long, over the course of five years and two administrations, without the FTA ATF field office in Phoenix or the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona stepping in to halt it? What allowed it to go on for so long unchecked? Second, what should we do now to ensure that this never, ever happens again? I know that the IG has made his recommendations, and I have also made my own. Which of these recommendations have ATF and the Department already implemented? Which should be prioritized? And which may require legislation? 
Again, Mr. Harvest, I thank you again and your staff for an excellent job. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I now ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Barber, be allowed to participate in today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I also would reserve the right to waive additional members in uh, as they arrive. Pursuant to our rules, members sitting on the dais will uh, be recognized only after all other uh, individuals on their side of the aisle have previously been recognized on a back and forth basis. But with that, I also would like to thank Mr. Barber for making the effort to uh, be there for the Brian Terry naming and for uh, representing that area of, of Arizona that I think uh, is so affected by Fast and Furious. Pursuant to the rules, all witnesses before this committee will be sworn, so I'd ask that our witness please rise to take the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? With that, uh, the record will recognize that Mr. Horowitz uh, answered in the affirmative. General, we normally talk a lot about the five minutes. Take the time you need to give us your opening, recognizing that it will be a long day of additional opportunities for you to answer questions not in your opening. And with that, the gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I ask that my full statement be made a part of the record. Without objections or order. And I, I have uh, pared that down somewhat so that I don't go on for 20 or 30 minutes. And I will try to stick to the five minutes, certainly. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you to the members of the committee uh, for inviting me to testify today about our report. A report that we released yesterday which details a pattern of serious failures in both ATF's and the U.S. Attorney's Office's handling of the investigations in Fast and Furious and Wide Receiver and the Justice Department's response to congressional inquiries about those flawed operations. This is my first opportunity to testify before the Congress since I was sworn in five months ago and it's an honor to be here today. Um, during the confirmation process, I made a commitment to the Congress and to the American people that I would continue the strong tradition of my office for independence, nonpartisanship, impartiality, and fairness. Those are the standards that I and my office applied in conducting this review and in preparing this report. As in all of our work, we abided by one bedrock principle, to follow the facts and the evidence wherever they led. And as indicated previously, this report could not have been done without the extraordinary dedication of the staff and the employees in my office. They worked long nights, weekends, through vacations, and I couldn't thank them enough, and I appreciate the committees thanking them for their hard work. As indicated, we reviewed over 100,000 pages of documents here. We interviewed over 130 witnesses, many on multiple occasions. The witnesses we interviewed served at all levels of the department, from the current and the former attorneys general to the line agents in Arizona who handled the investigations. Very few witnesses refused our request to be interviewed, and where they ha did refuse, we noted those in the report. The Justice Department provided us with access to the documents we requested, including documents concern from post-February 4th concerning the department's response to the congressional inquiries. We operated with complete and total independence in our search for the truth and the decision about what to cover in this report and the conclusions that we reached were made by us and our office and by no one else. I'm pleased that we've been able to put forward to the Congress and to the American people a full and complete recitation of the facts that we found and the conclusions that we reached with minimal redactions by the department to our report. The administration made no redactions for executive privilege, even though our report evaluates in detail and reaches conclusions about 